I should start by saying that it's the uh, 4th of February 2013. We're here in Carrara interviewing um, Graham Hideki and uh, interviewing U.S. Robert Trudell and myself, Yanni Nakulsey. Mm -hmm. I have to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. How do you pronounce my name? Hideki? Or mm -hmm. Surname or first name? No, last name. Hideki? Oh, yeah. You would, wouldn't say Tidika? Oh, if I were to say it in, yeah. in your world. Um, <laughs> Tidika? Yeah, you wouldn't yeah. say I at the end, you would say uh. And that's, yeah. I think, where I yeah. had the trouble with spelling your name because I would write an, an I, not yeah. an e. The reason I asked this question is uh, I was anglicized mm -hmm. when I came here. From where? From Germany. But this mm -hmm. was like 1850 mm -hmm. or 60 before Germany was even German. And, uh, and it, was got, it was a hard name to pronounce. And my son lives in London mm -hmm. and he pronounces it Tidika like they do. In a, in a pretty yeah. European pronunciation. And so I, but I never quite had the courage to do it. I'm right? <laughs> <laughs> so used to hearing it one way. Yeah. No, I, yeah, if I were, were in Belgium, I would say Tidica, not Tidica. Yeah, Tidica. anyway, that's mm -hmm. wondering. Um, well, the first question is what architectural qualifications did you gain and from which institution? Yeah, well, I started in 1960 after finishing um, grade 12 or senior, as it was, and went straight to, I think it was the CTC? Yeah, George Street. George Street, mm. yeah, Technical College, I think it was. Central it? Technical College. Di Diploma in Architecture. Mm. And, uh, which was three years um, at night, and then the last three years were at Queensland Union at night. Then we joined, we combined with the unit, with the full-time course. So I went through in full, in six years, I didn't want to, most of the people that I went through took usually seven, some even longer, because you'd miss one subject and you'd have to go and do it again. So I didn't want to hang around, but I, but I wasn't in the mm. what lifesavers. It wasn't the nature all surf lifesavers, and of course they wouldn't do their work and they wouldn't study much because they were so busy on the weekends enjoying themselves. So yeah, so I went through six years. Well, one of the few. Yeah, it was, it was, I found that out later. I was surprised because in the final year, I realized that every year we'd, we'd start off in a bit entirely different group of people and the people you started with were dwindling rapidly. And in the end, I think there was only about one or two out of about 30, 20 or 30 that went through, well, some very small number anyway. Do you remember who they were? Uh, Brian Simpson, I think, was one. Um, that's about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and well, I only remember him because I knew him for over a longer period of time. And the people you that were teaching you, do you remember any of those yes, particularly? Yes, yes, I do. For, for some strange reason, um, Mr. Brecknell, from Bly, Joseph Brecknell, Athel yeah. Brecknell, I couldn't remember his first name, Athel, who was a gentleman, um, he was the first um, sort of gentleman architect I really um, came to appreciate because he had a lot of knowledge, especially history, and I loved history. Um, also, Steve Trotter, who was a design, I always remember Steve, um, I got on very well with him, and in fact his son, uh, who I got to know in subsequent years, um, I sort of got to know him as much, almost, not as well, but in the course of architectural things, like we went to, took all the students to Sydney one year, and, and uh, he, was, uh, he was one of the students. Well, he has at least two sons who did architecture. Which one are we talking oh, about? Oh, um, his name. I know him so well. The one went into sculpture. Yes. And the guy, the, the guy I'm talking about, he's now, like, he runs the office. He's, it's his company. Yeah. Terrible um, yeah. Oh, I know him too, but I can't yeah. remember his name. Yeah, it'll come in. <laughs> Apologise for that. I, um, yeah, so I remember Steve very well. And uh, Jessup. Colin Jessup, mm -hmm. remember him, and uh, gosh, that's about it. So 
So you mentioned names, I'd go yes, of course, but I'm recalling them as... Well, Cole Tesh used to teach us specifications in my day, but... No, it wasn't, it wasn't him. Um, I don't even remember who that was. John Day used to teach us construction. John Day was, in, was, a, was a structural, yes, and I've, I've met him a few years ago, and uh, he looks the same as he did then, and bright as a button, he's a lovely man. I mm -hmm. really like John. Um, well, uh, w because it was a, a part-time night course, where did you start working immediately? Yes, yeah. Um, on the uh, 28th of January 1960, I walked into the office and sat down and, and Don Williamson said, ah, so you think you can draw perspective? Well, here, draw this interior of the Southport, no, the Surface Paradise ANZ Bank remodeling it or something and I had to do this perspective of the, of the front entry and the counter and all of that. Did you have the job at that stage? Yeah, that was the first day. Oh, okay. So first, first job on the first day. <laughs> but uh, actually I, I was interviewed by Brendan, a man who I really, really had an immense amount of time for. He, he was like, he was a, um, if you can have such a thing as an ethical um, to, uh, mentor, he was mine. Um, a number of times he would do and say things that just made me feel like what he was saying was so right, so appropriate, there was no other way. And um, anyway, in the interview I had with him to get the job, uh, I, had, I used to do all of these drawings before I started architecture. And I had all these architectural drawings and I had I'd drawn the treasury building and all the of other main buildings and houses and things just as a hobby and he looked at them all and said yes yes well they were very nice very nice you know. but you must remember that architecture is also about drainage and leaks and he went to his list and i could see that he was smiling underneath his you know he was sort of saying all this to see what my reaction was because here i was drifting off on this wonderful thing about this is all architecture drawing beautiful pictures. And he grounded me very quickly. And, uh, and I thought, thank you, but I'm even more determined that that's not a problem. And um, then years, in the years that's passed, things would happen. Like one day he called me into his office and he said, um, oh, Graham, he said, I, I just want to say something to you. And I'm sitting there thinking I'm about to be sacked or fired or something or I've done something wrong. And he said, um, I saw you on New Farm Street at nine o'clock the other night or wherever it was, and I drove by. And I said, I didn't see you. He said, no, I know you didn't see me because I saw you and I very rudely did not give you a wave. I want to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought, wow, I know, who am I, this man? He said, you know, went to all that trouble to tell me that he'd seen me and hadn't acknowledged. And, th and that happened time and through all sorts of instances like this. Uh, we used to have to run, look after the switchboard. We had a switchboard with plugs and things in those days. And when the girl went away on lunch, I used to have to go and work the switchboard. You may have done it also. Was it Miss Banfield? Yeah, Miss Banfield was the secretary. And I, you know, then you, the big fear was you'd get the wrong plug and you'd... And you'd you'd plug someone completely outrageous into him and he'd pick up the phone thinking it was a client and he'd get this strange person on the other end and of course he'd come out and really let you have it. And um, anyway, one day he called me in and I thought, oh, I've done it again. And he said, um, oh, he said, uh, you do call everybody Mr. and Mrs. and Miss? I said, yes. He said, good. He said, there's a trend these days not to do that. And I just want to make sure that we look after our clients by calling them appropriately, addressing them appropriately. <laughs> little things, it was little things, apart from the big things. And But the most, probably the most um, impressive moment I ever had with him was um, when uh, he was asked by the Archbishop or the Diocese to do that little chapel for the Archbishop and uh, in the grounds of Farsley up on 
Albion Heights. And um, he said, uh, ah, I've done, I'd just like to show you the sketch I've done. And he showed me this drawing and it had a, um, a little rectangular, perfectly detailed Gothic chapel. Very simple, but in the Gothic style. And he said, I've done this because it complements the house, which was 1880 or something, in, in the stone and everything, Helen stone, same stone. So uh, I said, oh, yeah, that's very nice. He said, would you like to do one? Uh, they, the, they want an alternative design. And, I'll, and would you like to do one? And maybe some of the boys out there we can get together and you can do a, an alternative design. So we did. There were a few of us and we got together. And, and uh, Anyway, what came out <coughs> was this Frank Lloyd Wright Unitarian Chapel sort of <laughs> design. <laughs> but it was stone walls and sort of things. And uh, so he took it back and he looked at it and didn't say a word, but I knew he was very surprised. He went off to the meeting and he came back and said, uh, they've decided to go with this one. And it turned out, I heard later, that someone in the act, someone advising the diocese said, oh, you've got to get something modern, you know, it's got to be, got to be with the times. So they, we did this thing, and um, the first design came in, and of course it had this big hovering roof, big copper roof that hovered over these stone walls. And uh, when it was all finished, he uh, called me in again and he said, I only have one question for you. He said, um, I just don't know whether this is landing or taking off. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's the problem with egos. <laughs> and I never forgot that. So, uh, yeah, that was my, my memories of Brendan. He was a fine, fine human being. This is Brendan Gargett we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, one other, while we're on Brent, on Gargit, Conor Gargit, there was another instance which was very memorable in that one day, uh, doing, you know, how you would do your presentation drawings and you'd do sheets and sheets of drawings and all of them, some coloured with watercolour and perspectives. And, and then uh, you'd have to, to, to get them priced by a builder, you would have to do this quite you know, large number of drawings. And he called me and said, <coughs> let me show you something. And he brought out this one sheet of Watman's watercolour paper with, with this Ipswich Hospital drawing. And it was plans, one, one or two plans, and then the elevations and a little detail of a window, and that was it on this one sheet of paper. And he said, that's what we gave to the builder to price. He had one night, and then he would bring it back and we'd give it to another builder and he would price it off this one watercolour drawing. And then when we chose the builder, we would give him that drawing and he would then build the, the, build the whole building from that one drawing. And I looked at the drawing and it was quite spotless. It was, you know, this was now, this was 1960 and the drawing was 1890, 1870 or something. And it had been in the vault, Conrad and Gargit vault. And somehow, somehow it came out, but anyway, I looked at this thing and, and I thought, what was incredible was that it relied on everybody knowing what to do. You didn't have to tell a builder how to hammer a nail or put something on. Everybody knew what they had to do. And why this was so important was I thought, well, that's the world's not like that anymore. It doesn't exist. And then when I lived in Mexico and I was building there, building houses and so on. We just set up a practice one day and, and went for many years building these beautiful big old homes. And they were all built um, with one drawing and everybody knew exactly what to do. And they were all handmade. Everything was handmade except for glass in the windows and the copper plumbing. Everything else was handmade. Lights, furniture, everything. And we finished one of these and I suddenly remembered this moment with Ben Gard and his drawing and thought, well, what I've just experienced is like 70 years, 80 years, 90 years out of, I mean, I mean a time warp. 
this doesn't exist anymore, I didn't think it did. And it will disappear from this place very soon too. So I sort of stepped back into history and actually the physically lived out the history of, some, of what it used to be like here 80 years previous. And it was a really interesting experience because I learned how people related to their craft, to the building, to the instructions, to the overall... They all had a feeling for the architecture. Whereas we divide everything into little composite segments and then hope they all come together. And computers have made that a lot better because that does all the composing. So, you know, it, it's a different world. But, but this was just one moment of my particular career where I came to grips with what w the essence of something that was totally lost. So you could never you get it back. And this came back through this experience. So when was this? That was 1970. Uh, between 68 and 75. So it was very interesting. And you stayed at Comet and Garget for the entire duration of your... Uh for entire, yeah, I was with them for the full six years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you remember any of the other projects that you worked on while you were there? Yeah, yeah, I worked on the SJO building um, with Keith Frost. And uh, <laughs> they'd done the, you know, I did all the perspectives and I used to do all these beautiful coloured renderings and... I don't know if they still exist, but I'll, sh I'll show you one when I get. But they um, a photograph that I had. Um, but um, he said, Brendan again said, "Oh, we'd like to do an alternative design." Yes, <laughs> I am. Um, and he was smiling when he said it, and so I did. And because it was, you know. It wasn't um, possible or re relevant. It was just, I, I'm not sure why he did it, except just, I think he was curious to see what, you know, what sort of other interpretations there would be. And uh, anyway, but so there was that building, and there was the uh, Commonwealth Bank building, um, with Shun Lee did that. And I learned a lot from Shun, I learned a lot. From yeah. I learned to draw from him. Yeah, I just thought his drawings were just. He was a beautiful draftsman, and I had, I had a fair bit to do with him one way or another. Yeah. And I really liked him. He was very gentle, very thorough, totally de focused, dedicated sort of guy. Where did he come from? I think he was China somewhere, but I don't know. I think he was born here. His parents might have been. I don't know, um, but uh, he's, he married a, an Australian girl and had a family, mm. and. Uh, I never thought of him as anything other than I suppose him. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Well, with, with the SGIO building, I can remember you doing that alternative, and my memory of it was that it was a kind of twisting tower. Wow, you've got an incredible memory. Well, I could show you the drawing, but in it, it actually, it did, it, it had a wide base. I was, at this point of my career, it was all Japanese. You know, this was all Kenzo Tangy, brutalism and all that kind of really into that big way. And this building had a had a tapered um, had a wide base and tapered up to an arrow top. And almost like, you know, what became the atrium. It had an atrium before atrium were even named, so all of those kind of concepts were t were too hard to grapple with and really no one took much notice of them. But it it was it, it it wasn't a serious yeah, attempt well because it wasn't enough time. It was just something interesting. See what the students would make of this kind of thing. Is what I yeah. took it at the time as being. But um, I don't know. I can't read their minds. But, but I can remember. I mean, Frosty was the kind of designer on the Needham House side. Yeah. And, but you were, kind of, the other one, <laughs> and so. I can remember Frosty <coughs> having some pictures of the Pan American building on his desk and, oh, yeah. and kind of doing a version of the Pan American building to fit on that site and ah. turning it was the big kind of breakthrough that you turned it yeah. so that it didn't have shadows on the square or I yeah, don't quite yeah, yeah, remember right. what the mm -hmm. logic was but mm -hmm. 
Um, of course, the, the proportions of the Pan American building didn't fit the size that this building was going to be, so it didn't really work. And he did a few sketches, and you did that really out there twisting <laughs> one that, that actually did face the square but started off yeah. orthogonal to the streets, I think. Oh, right. um, anyway, I can't remember more than that, but, yeah. but there was a kind of, a, I thought anyway, a um, competition between you and Frosty as, oh, to, really? as to what <laughs> you know this was going to be, yeah. which was their big job. Oh, really? And uh, Frosty didn't actually get on well with everybody. Yeah. And he was, uh, well, my memory of him, he was known as Mumbles and he was always yeah. sort of grumbling about yeah. somebody or other. <laughs> and in the case of Hank Lightus, he used to be pretty forthright in his criticisms. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. he thought, boy, you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of him. No, he was a funny man. I, I um, actually, I. I I saw a little bit of a soft side to him. Yeah, well. you got on well with him. Yeah, because he, he respected you, and uh, yeah. probably it was mutual. Well, it's interesting. I never ever got. I never got that message because, you know, he was like, he was such a powerful um, presence and, and everything. I was scared of the guy. <laughs> but, but not scared. I mean, I, I was overwhelmed with his knowledge, experience, and he was so good at what he did that I really acknowledge that and I didn't have any experience or knowledge much so anything I did was purely an idea that came from somewhere and I would have no idea how we would take it on board but now you said I remember he used to come back and I I did all these sketches for him like there was one was the um, all of his fire stations the main fire station in, in um, the big central Kemp place yeah I did all these sketches for that and and he used to ask, and there were office buildings, and I'd forgotten all that, but I sort of thought it was just, he couldn't find anybody else to do it, sort of. <laughs> well, he, he did sort of spend time on his own, yeah. and he liked to do things his way, yeah. and whereas Lou was kind of farming work out all over the place. Yeah. And, and, uh, Lou would really let you go, I mean, yes. I, I used to do all these. Um, I entered banks for Lou, with Lou, and he, he'd sort of let you go. He, he was third and fourth year doing the designs and the documentation and the complete project supervision, like on managing the contracts and all of that, until he got into trouble. I mean, Lou was always there. He was like an x-ray machine. He, could, he knew what you were doing even if he wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> he was quite amazing. I just uh, that guy was, was my mentor, my first mentor, and uh, he was so um, he, he just sort of had it right. Every, everything he did was spot on. He didn't need to didn't mess around or waffle. He was just like, "This is what it is," and you, you went, "Yeah, well, can't argue with that." But he let you go, and, and I could never. Um, thank him enough for having had the courage to let this young bod, young architect, young student, do this stuff. And the trust that he put in you was phenomenal. I mean, I would go off on an airplane to, to Oki, we did an, a bank up there, and, and he was a town that had um, black soil, and all the buildings, every time it rained, the buildings went up, when the soil expanded and when it went down they stayed there. Yeah. Then it came up next time and they, they sort of went off a bit of an angle and you had all the telephone poles along the road were all these different angles. And I walked up there and the first day and the builder said, oh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll bet you a thousand dollars this building is crooked within two years. So I had a bet with him because I had been working with McWilliams, R.J. McWilliams, the engineer, who Lou and, yeah. I mean, Lou and, and them. And John Day. Was that John Day? I guess, it, no, anyway, yeah, probably was. Anyway, they said, you put it on piles and it's no problem, you see, so I had this magic trick with this builder that I knew it wasn't going to move. And, uh, but he, you know, he would just let me go and do that. And I was incredibly trustworthy of him, yeah. uh, trustful of him. And anyway, 
I went out there just a few years ago, and the bank is still there. Square and horizontal, <laughs> and everything else is all sort of over the place. This building's sitting there, and it's still a bank. The only thing they've ever done is paint one the wall, which I had white and they painted it black or vice versa. Or whatever. Still there, bang, stick, bang on. So, and I. You happy with it? Yeah, yeah, it was a lovely little bank. Hmm? And there were a few of them around town. There was one up in, in Edward Street, Upper Edward Street. There was one up there. And I worked on that one. Did you? I used to do stuff under you hmm. for, you know, counters and. Yeah, that's like. right. Now I remember that, yeah, because. Uh, because I, and I remember working on site when the first day we started, and the builder and the engineer was there. And it's another one of those moments when a light bulb goes on about the wisdom of all the people. The engineer, the old guy who was um, doing a ground survey to see whether the ground was, whether it needed piles or just ordinary footing, and the, his young engineer, like my age, was going around with some meter, checking, bouncing, and getting the vibrations or the pressure or whatever it was to test the, the compactness of the ground. And he's off there doing all of this, took him about an hour, and the old boy is standing there beside me and he says, he's doing a good job, that young man. He said, he's a good engineer. He says, but I'll tell you what. And then he, then he jumped up and down three times and said, we'll come back with a reading of three or whatever the number was. Or maybe 3.2. Ran back there. So this guy comes back <laughs> an hour later, says, oh, I've got it all worked out, I've taken average over the whole site, and what I recommend is 3.1. <laughs> and the old guy says, Very good. <laughs> you know, didn't say a word, and I never said a word, and I thought, you know, that's just the experience of having done something for so long. You just get the feel of it, and you can feel ground, and feel air, and you can feel all these things. And I thought that so much, the architecture was so much more than. No, just the components. It was that other level of, of sensing how people were going to respond or live in it or whatever. But it was moments like that that, that ground you into there is a, another level that you don't understand and won't understand until you've done your time. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Well, of those banks that you mentioned, there's one on the corner of um, Turbot Street and George Street that's still there. It's much. Um, it's no longer a bank. And oh, that was that was one of Frosty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. which was the best of those banks that you think? I mean, there were a lot of them. Oh, uh, well, there's one particular one, believe it or not, in Annerley, yeah. uh, and little ANZ in Annerley. It's now a um, real estate office. But um, I really liked that <laughs> because I was born over the road. <laughs> Went, there was a hospital over the road and uh, in between air raid sirens, I came into the world on a very hot summer's day. And, um, and it wasn't until I was, the hospital was long gone. And uh, anyway, I, my mother said to me one day, where's this bank you're talking about now? So we went by in the car and said, oh, that's it over there. And then she told me that, you know, she'd given birth across, right across the road. Then it turned into a, um, a takeaway joint for a while. And it had a big sign, big pylon. Yeah, it has a big pylon, yeah. yeah. Um, and the pylon's still there. I went by some about a year ago or something. The bank's still there, the pylon's still, everything's still there. Because um, it had the front wall was the big safe, you know, the, the, the bank vault was huge thickness and with all this tang bar they used to call it, steel in the middle. But you put it on the outside so that no one could blow it up without being seen. <laughs> it was yeah. sort of um, what we call passive surveillance these days. Mm. Um, you worked on the Commonwealth Bank? Yeah, not much. I did the sketches, um, the perspective, um, which I took a photograph of, and I'll show you if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and because what's interesting about that was that I put in a, I had this sense of history about during the drawing, and I thought, I'll put in a tram because the trams are going to disappear, and I'll put in a trolley bus because the trolley buses are going to disappear, and I'll put in a bit of King George Square because King George Square is going to disappear, and Wallace Bishop's on the corner because that's going to, I had this sense of, 
of everything changing in time. So this was like you know, a ma capturing a moment. And um, anyway, subsequently they all did disappear, of course. But the one thing that was interesting was uh, when I did the building, I thought, ah, oh, the sketch needed to have a bit of warmth about it. It wasn't very, it wasn't very dynamic. So um, I put this, uh, I put this very dark sky, like a storm, black sky in the background, which really gave the, the, the uh, drawing contrast and you know, presence. Anyway, Brendan said to me, I don't know whether I like the storms over the <laughs> bank. It's not a very good symbol. <laughs> and he would always say these things, you know, with his tongue firmly stuck in his cheek, but it was lovely. It was so I thought. You know, and I said to him, well, I did it to make your building look better. He said, good. Well, who do you think designed that building? Because it's quite different. To yeah, I think, that was Mer I think that was Shun. I think that was. I'm. I don't want to. I don't want to sound ignorant because I might be missing. Someone else might say, "Oh, no, it wasn't him." But he he did all the drawings and had a lot to do with it because I I did I worked on it with him and he was the only person doing it. I don't know whether Frosty had anything to do with that. Did Lou? He may he probably did. Um, but being Lou, he would have been in the background, sort of you know driving from the back seat. He just had this wonderful way of, of having everything under control, but you never saw him doing it. Mm. He's a bit of a magician. And sort having of a joke at the same time. Having a joke, yeah. Yeah, yeah I really, Lou was a very special guy in my life. Yeah. Mm, when you were just talking about uh, the buildings that you worked on, you referenced um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and Kenzo Tanya, but where did you know their work from? How did you, get, oh. was it? taught at CTC at the time? Yeah, well, I had this weird, no, I had this way of understanding learning architecture mm. by realizing that, and I always had this notion that, um, that when you come into this world, <laughs> you're coming with not much knowledge or information. Um, and, and then you quickly learn what's gone before because you see it, the experience, you live in it, or you hear about it, or whatever. And then you add a bit. Your life, you add something to that. Mm -hmm. The next person that comes along, the next young person, takes all that went before you, plus you, and they add their bit. So it's this continuum where you, everybody adds their little bit to the recipe. And so I thought, I wanted to get, I was very impatient, I wanted to get there quickly, and I wanted to get building up. Like from a very early time, I wanted to get physically doing something. So um, I thought, well, the best way to learn about Frank Lloyd Wright is to build Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, one or two. You're using using projects as a sort of an experiment to learn, but that was the way it was. And, and so I would practice a bit of Frank Lloyd Wright just to understand why he did it and what it meant. And but how did you know about Frank Lloyd Wright? Because oh, I don't remember him ever being mentioned at the... Uh, well, I never course. mentioned him because no one wanted him mentioned. It was like, it, was, it wasn't, he wasn't, from my understanding, he wasn't appreciated much. And I found out later why he was pretty, if you knew about anything about the man, he was a very arrogant, mm -hmm. terrible man to get along with. Um, and I know this because my partner in Mexico, his sister, was Frank Lloyd Wright's secretary in Phoenix, when he was in Taliesin West. And uh, she was telling me one day when I was there that uh, she said, oh yes, Mr. Wright was a very difficult man. She said, I remember we, we left the office one day and he drove me home in his big black Packard and we went into the gas station and we filled up. And the guy filled it up and said, it's, it's now full, Miss, it's now full. And he walked around Get, take the money off Mr. Wright, and Mr. Wright just drove off. And the lady said, oh, you shouldn't, you forgot to pay him. And Frank said, doesn't he know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> so, and then all I've read, I've read a lot, you know, studied him thoroughly and read a lot of his books and so on. So I got a sort of a picture of the man. But um, it w I realised what my affinity with him was, your, I, I, I was loved organic architecture. Mm. Um, and 
I, I wasn't a machine man. I, I had trouble with modernism because it wasn't organic enough, um, which was my probably my inability to look at modernism on a broader spectrum, but that was my impression in those days. And then uh, I loved the, the organic form of, of the Japanese. In fact, what the Japanese were doing after the war, they had no... They timber was in short supply and they were in the dire straits, so they turned to the simplest form of building material to rebuild, and that was concrete. And the people like Kenzo Tang and, and all the other great Japanese architects who blossomed in those years had a big impact on us. We used to get the Japanese architect magazine, and, mm. and uh, pe people like Peter Heath were in these houses in Brisbane were all very Japanese looking, and so anything that was Japanese or mm. was had an impact for a number of years. And so th those people, anybody who was organic in their approach <laughs> appealed to me mm -hmm. um, and had sculpture. I always saw architecture as, as living sculpture, you know, stuff you could live in and, and it had some life to it, a soul, or whatever you call it, but interest. You know, it wasn't just a bland box, it mm -hmm. had some particular interest. Well, there were a lot of people who got into um, ceramics and did pottery, in, and they were looking to Japan as well. Yes. Were you conscious of that happening? Yes. In well, in fact, my old, I, in, when I graduated in 1966, I wanted to leave the country. I wanted to, to catch up to the, with the rest of the world. And we used to get around saying, we're not Australians, we're universal people. We're people of the world. <laughs> and we were... We were into this universal man sort of stuff um, and get away from parochialism because it was, you couldn't expand and grow, you know, typical useful approach. And I thought, what I'll do is I'll go to, I'll go to Canada and I'll learn and I'll get in touch, I'll, I'll work with a Canadian American firm that does a job in, in Tokyo or Japan and I'll go to Japan because that's where I, where I really want to be. So. I went to um, Canada and um, ended up, got a job with Arthur Erickson. This would be 66? In 60, left in 66, worked with him from 66 to late 68. And because uh, Erickson was like Canada's greatest architect and brilliant man. And where was he? In Vancouver. And he was my second mentor. Anyway, and I worked with him. Um, I was sort of like his design assistant. And uh, lo and behold, there was a World's Fair in Osaka in 1970. And so he was, there was a competition to build the Canadian Pavilion. So I worked on that with him, just he and I. In the, and the way he worked was very strange. He was a brilliant genius of a man. And he would, things would just suddenly appear. But he'd let you go for weeks and weeks doing what you thought was important. Then he'd come along and he'd just say one or two words. And you'd realise you were on the wrong track, but he had exactly what was needed. And so, you know, <laughs> I learned what it was like to, to be tutored by a genius. And he really was a brilliant man with a, a wonderful mind. Uh, he used to have radio programs on art and radio for years and spoke a couple of languages. Anyway, so we did this thing. We won the competition, uh, but uh, very quickly he had the whole office involved. I mean, I only worked with him up to a point, and I kept going on it. But then the whole office came in and got the the combined efforts of everybody, and it really was a, a you know a full-on total office involvement. And um, plus an engineer from California. Anyway, we won the job. And the reason we won it, <laughs> he reckons that when they were about to hand the model and he said let's put a little handle on the side of the model a little tiny handle and it had it was an open pyramid and it had these circular four circular inverted umbrellas that were done in psychedelic patterns and he said uh, if you turn this little handle these things rotate on the model and uh, I said yeah well, why are you doing that he said if you're a judge and you have all of these models, hundreds of them, dozens, whatever it might be, 
and you're trying, and they're all great, and you just don't know which one you like, and you see one with a handle on it, <laughs> there's no way you're not going to go down and turn the handle, and when you turn the handle, you're hooked. <laughs> uh, needless to say, one, but it, one for other reasons, not the handle. But I just, that, and he, that was the final touch, that was the icing that just did it, you know, that just took it, separated it from the others. So that was very interesting, and uh, so then I thought, right, well, I'll go to Japan now and, and you know, supervise this job. Well, wow. And then, of course, 12 months out of, 12 months graduated, right, thinking you had the ability to do something like this. It was sort of naive at best, but anyway, um, he said, oh, I think, and he was so nice, I, th I think Roger might just be a little bit more... Um, skilled and have a little bit more experience in this. He's been doing it for 25 years. <laughs> so he goes to Japan and does this and I thought, well, that was lovely. I, I you know, I learned a, a wonderful lesson about ego and very quickly. And I thought, well, that was a, that was an apex. So then we just went on a trip, packed up our Volkswagen Combi and took off for six months and we ended up in Mexico. But that, uh, so that was where Japan came to an end at that point. That, um, I learned a lot about Japanese architecture from him doing that project. And one thing was, at one point we were, had an earth-covered roof. And he said, uh, I said, why are you putting earth-covered roof? He said, a pavilion. He said, oh, he said, the Japanese have trouble with dichotomy. With, they have trouble understanding things that don't make sense. Like, you don't walk on a roof. The roof is above your head. You don't put your feet on the roof. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, then, uh, so that moved off, and then finally he said, I, I think I know what we'll do. We'll have this pyramid at 45 degree angle, and we'll have it in mirrors. And it had never been a mirrored building. This was the first mirrored glass faced building. And, and so the idea was that you will always see the sky, and you'll see clouds going along and dropping down, and you'll see a jumbo jet go along and then go straight down, or come up from the ground. He said, that will really get them confused. Much more than walking on a roof, much better. So that's what happened. And so it became the first sort of mirrored, mirrored building and um, did just that. So when you went to Canada, were you aware of people like John Andrews as well? Ah, no, not till I came back. Um, oh, in, yes, I'd heard of him, but not much in Canada. He was, I, I, although I did go to Scarborough College, Yes, I did, because I went to Scarborough College on the way, driving all over. And I went to I went to Harvard also to see Paul Rudolph's architecture school. Mm. And because it was a Japanese brutalist, you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and that whole fascination with that architectural stream came to a very quick end when a year later, after we'd, I'd seen this the School of Architecture, it was really... You know, quite a massive building. And a year later, all the architecture students burned the building down. <laughs> they said it a lot because it was so inhuman and so dominating and, what you know, controlled them so much they didn't feel comfortable, so they burned it. <laughs> and I thought, well... Oh, yeah. Was it then demolished or was it rebuilt? No, oh, it was concrete. It was a bit hard to burn. <laughs> but, but they made a mess of it. <laughs> they made their point and they, they... I don't know what they did. I've never been back and followed it, but I thought... Yeah, that was, it was again one of those realisations that you can't just force stuff on people um, to a point where it really gets them angry, and especially architecture students, you know, when they get angry. Because I remember going back to when, uh, the CTC when we were about third or fourth year, we all decided that the college was terrible. Mm -hmm. This is probably one of your other questions about education. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And... Um, we all decided that the course was terrible. This is when we realised that we weren't universalists, we weren't modernists, we weren't, we were living in the past. We wanted to get, you know, catch up with Melbourne because they used to come up and make visits. These university students from Melbourne and Sydney schools would come up and show us what they were doing, and we would go, "Well, we'll just go back to our hay shed," you know. <laughs> it was embarrassing. So we decided, well, we have to take the bull by the horns and change the whole direction of design and. Mm -hmm education and of course we didn't know what we were talking about but we made a lot of noise and we had meetings and people stumped on tables and we <laughs> you know, 
sort of thing that, you know, angry young men do without knowing what they're doing. And um, anyway, lo and behold, uh, the next thing we get, one of our, our next assignment was a school of architecture. They said, well, if they are so upset about it, let them design one and we'll keep them busy. So they kept their minds busy and um, we did that. And then nothing much happened and then I went away. And while I was away, Eddie Codd turned up and the whole thing became an, you know, on its way to becoming a university. And when I came back, I, I went to see, you know, I studied, I teach, I taught there for a while. And uh, I got to know Eddie and he was a man who, for whom I have immense respect. He was an, had an amazingly acute intellect um, and really knew what he was doing. And I felt very lucky that I'd actually had a bit of time to get to know the man. So when was this? This was about 70, five, six, seven, something like that. And he was, had an academic position there, didn't he? He was the head of the school. He, he actually created a new school of architecture. Oh. Took it out of the past and brought it into the future. And uh, he, what he was doing was dynamic stuff, really, and by local standards, it was universally, you know, probably the norm in other places. But uh, all credit to him and the people that he worked with. Uh, and they gave him the, the um, freedom to do what he thought was right. And he did a fantastic job. For, my, for what I saw, I mean, I was a part-time lecturer, but I was very impressed with the direction and uh, the lecturing that we did there. We just took off and did the most, the wildest <laughs> stuff. And it was very interesting. Very Good for the students. And who were uh, in the group of angry young men at the time when you were protesting? Do you remember? And, and when was that? Yes. That was, um, oh yeah, there was, uh, well, it was, we got the, the University of Queensland was there, and there was a guy called John Davis, and uh, he, who I had a fair bit to do with after that, um, and uh, Bill Heather was in it. Well, it, it coincided, I think, with the student convention that was on in Brisbane at that time. Oh, I did it. And there was a lot of discussion at well, either before or during that conference about architecture and its education oh. and how it's taught. Was that the one and that John Davis had a big part? In yeah, it. John was running it, by the way. And who was the Italian architect? Ponti. Gio Ponti came. That's ah. Uh, I'd, I'd had forgotten all of that, but you're right. That's what because John Davis, it was like the moment we started, however it all started, John was on the scene very quickly and was running the meeting. <laughs> John was a quite a pol politician in a way, uh, and uh, he just loved that sort of organising big things. And uh, now you mentioned that's right. He, so, and I knew that he had organised for Ponty to come or mm. he and maybe. Um, well, who were the others? It was um, Jack Kershaw. Yeah, Jack Kershaw, that's was, right. Um, yep. Graham Hume. Yes. Um, i just forgotten. I, did, I only remember a couple of the names, but, but now you mention them, I, they all come back very clearly. But it was kind of coming from UQ rather than from, um, from QUT, or QIT as it was. Yeah, well, I think you're right. Um, it sort of swept in, it all happened sort of so quickly and simultaneously. But uh, yes, now you now I think about it, the well, it was real... all over, wasn't it? I mean, 68 Well, it was, was the time, yeah, it was that <laughs> the time had come for war runs to think of other things. Um, it, it, you know, it was just happening, the world was changing and, and, uh, and the 60s had finally caught up with Brisbane. And they weren't burning things down, but they were everywhere else and you thought, What's oh. wrong with us? Well, we talked about burning down. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of silly, a lot of hot air. Um, but I think it, what it did was it, uh, and it was um, ignited by Ponty, and, and that, you know, he was, uh, gave us a, a window to look through. And um, when that happened, you couldn't close the window once it was open, you know, yeah. all the butterflies were gone. So it was, yeah, that, that's. That's, thank you for that. I had a bit of a, a blank as to what 
caused it and how it happened, but no, it's an unspread. I can't remember a thing that he said, but I can remember just seeing him and thinking, wow, you know, yeah. this, this guy knows stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, I knew about his connection to Domus magazine. He was the yeah. editor and, yeah. and he designed so many things, including the Pirelli building. Yes. And yeah, you thought that was the big one that was our model for, for all, you know, for all high-rise buildings. That everything had to be a, a Pirelli, um, sort of a, a Pirelli inspiration. It was that was um, it was he was the next person after me, Spandero, that really understood how high-rise buildings should be. Yeah. In our opinion, I mean, yeah. in many ways of looking at it, but that was. In, at that time, that was the way we looked at it. I think John Davis worked for him. I think he turned up on his doorstep and got a job. With Pondit? Mm. Could have been, yeah. But I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't, it I might don't have know been someone that. else. But yes. No, I, I worked with John for quite a few years. Um, but they were all post that era. And um, I know you mentioned that vaguely, because I remember him always talking about Pondit. He was a great admirer of Ponte. Mm. So, do you, do you want to have some of that coffee before it goes cold? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> the, uh, I'm interested in this time that you, you, in 1968, you leave Vancouver and head off in the combi van to see... I guess the US, did you? No, we went actually from Vancouver. We did a lot of things in Vancouver. Um, and then we went to Alaska. We drove to Alaska in 67 um, when there was no Richmond Road. It took two weeks to get there and it was, we rolled the car and a few other things. But um, it was very rough and hard sort of thing. And we got there to Fairbanks and Everybody had left because the town had been flooded and all the basements were full of water. So when they freeze, they, they all pop. So they all left town. So we were the only people. <laughs> we certainly the only strangers in Alaska in, at that time. And we went up to some Eskimo villages and stayed with a guy who later became very famous, um, an Eskimo guy by the name of Willie the Lawyer, who has written many books and. He wrote one book called The Warriors of the Rainbow. It was all about um, Indian and folklore and prophecy and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, they, Greenpeace came along and read this book and mm -hmm. named their ship the Rainbow yes. Warriors after mm -hmm. Willie. So uh, then we went after that, we went right across Canada to the East Coast. We all down the East Coast to the US and Florida and then right across to the middle of um, the south and then went down into Mexico and went to school there and studied art for about six months or eight months or something at a university in this town of San Miguel de Allende. Um, and then that studied and we just had sort of like a, a sabbatical, study sabbatical. And uh, anyway, then by after about six or eight months, Annette was about eight months pregnant, so we thought we'd better get back to Canada. We, soon after we left, we ran into a guy and he said, I'd like to start an architectural office tomorrow morning. Would you like to start? Excuse me. So we had a few more vodkas and said, a few more tequilas. <laughs> said, yeah, why not? Couldn't speak the language, no money, wife pregnant, car running out. Like every reason what couldn't you know, no working papers. So the next morning we started an architectural practice. Right? Where? <laughs> in San Miguel. Yeah. And we did we were doing work in we ended up in, we did work in Mexico City and built some twenty or thirty houses in this yeah. town. Did work in Phoenix, New Mexico, California. And um, then we started a ceramic factory. We invented we we worked with a friend of ours on a new invention he had to make a new space age kiln. And uh, so we built one in our office, just out of an oil drum, with you know the modern little ceramic kiln that everybody has. 
Earl, and who began on a pig ranch <laughs> outside of San Miguel uh, with this guy who had a friend in NASA and he got some of this fiber pack, which is what they lined the inside of the, the re-entry, the Gemini entry, re-entry vehicle. And uh, it was the insulation that was much of it. And we got some of that, so we lined inside an oil drum, and we put in some burners, and we could reduce uh, like a, a one-week firing of ceramic down to 24 hours. And we built a couple of these, and we started manufacturing and selling all over the world. And, uh, and then we came up, you know, that's the stuff up there hmm. on the wall, that was the sort of thing. So we, the idea was we'd build each, every house we built, because it was all handmade, we would make all the tiles. That's what we'd sculpt the tiles and then produce the tiles and put them in. So all the houses, each, and there's row of tiles up there, I believe. Yeah. That sort of stuff. So yeah, it was a, we had a little factory here. Yeah. Then we made a film. Um, we wrote a film score and we took it up to Hollywood and took it up to New York. And they all wanted to, wanted to turn it. It was a metaphorical surrealistic Mexican story based on all the things that happened in their culture. But we got really into it. And anyway, it went to Hollywood and they said, well, as long as we turn it into a nice little romantic drama with some <laughs> something that has never happened, it's still in the can. So is this your sort of uh, magic mushroom period? Sort yeah, of, uh, without a single mushroom. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I had this. I always had this idea that if you want to get high, it's already there, and so never touched a drug, never needed it. It was a waste of time, and, and uh, because I, I could get, I could get all I ever wanted just from the imagination, basically. But there were people heading for Mexico for those reasons. Oh yeah, it was full of yeah. hundreds, thousands, all over the place, and uh, and. We were, we were separated from all that. We were in amongst it all, and probably looked like them, but <laughs> did a lot here in those days. But we didn't didn't get into any of the stuff, and so we never got any. We never had an ounce of trouble. Never. I mean, we lived a charmed, beautiful life of maids and happiness and everything else, simply because we just played it straight. <laughs> But it's very different to the kind of architecture that was inspiring you, the Japanese now. I mean, mm. this is this is not that. This is something <coughs> something else that you're getting Absolutely. from from the country <coughs> you're in. Yep. Well, we. My philosophy was that I came from a world that had a lot of. Um, you had the design process well honed. And you could bring in, you could constantly produce new design. Where with the environment we were working in, they were building all these wonderful things, but they're all ancient traditions and everything, and there was nothing new. So uh, we figured that if we could do something contemporary and then let it get sucked into the environment, it would turn into a traditional thing, but be modern. It was a it was like watching a metamorphosis happen. And so we would make the houses so they were comfortable for contemporary living, mm. but they had all the wonderful space and comfort of a, ha of a traditional Mexican house. This house, interior of this place, was intended to be <coughs> sort of a very calm sanctuary where you could come in here and absolutely peaceful and quiet and had the lovely spaces and light and environment and everything else happening um, in a very peaceful way and it was full of interest and so we started building these um, rather interesting houses and then they had a cement strike <coughs> all the cement for Germany was made in Mexico and they had a, short, a shortage in Germany so they took all the cement from Mexico and we could no longer build the concrete was difficult to build with so we decided to go back to square one and we noticed that there were a lot of the old vaulted buildings um, in the town. So we thought, oh well, if we build some vault and curved forms that have stayed very strong, 
we don't need to, we can reduce the amount of concrete and steel. So the last guy that knew how to build these vaults, Le Pise, mm -hmm. Le Pise, mud construction. No, 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 brick, no. brick, 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 with mortar joint. Mm -hmm. Well, it's sort of a mortar joint. And uh, anyway, uh, the last guy that knew how to build these was 80 years old. So we brought him in and said to each other, my partner and I, we said, oh, I think it's time we, we sort of went into overdrive with this old style and upgraded it to solve a contemporary problem. So we started building just simple barrel vaults. And there's no formwork. The guy just picked up a brick, put it on the other brick, hold it for 10 seconds, then he'd pick up another brick and would lay this circle. The only guide he had was a bent rebar. It was bent like in a half circle. And he just moved that along. That was a guide, a visual guide. He just laid all these bricks. And it turned the way they stayed up is they didn't lay the brick like this. The brick was laid like that. So the next brick wasn't on a vertical shear. It had a little bit of purchase. Yeah. It was a trick to hold them all up. And um, so then we got into, we did barrel vaults, then we got into elliptical vaults, and we got into intersecting barrel vaults, and then we got into gothic vaults. And we did the entire history of vaulting <laughs> in the two years until the strike ended. <clears throat> By this time we were doing very sort of artistic, sculptural things. And uh, it was an amazing experience. So when was this? This was 1970 to 73. Mm -hmm. Or four. When, when right through to 75, actually. We, once we started building these things, we couldn't stop. So when did you come back to Australia? Um, latter part of 75. And why did you? Back. Because our children by this time, we've both been born there, we're six and four, and it was a wonderful place to bring up children. There was no drugs and violence in those days. It was a lovely sort of paradise lost place. And um, they, uh, the children had a lovely you know, childhood, mm -hmm. but when you got to that age, we realised that education from there on, you're better off if you start off with education at the top of the pile and then you can go back down anywhere you want in the world. But if you start off at the bottom of the pile, you can never get right to the top in terms of acceptance, in terms of quality of education, all those sorts of things, which is why third world countries suffer because their education system is not equating the first world countries in all ways. And so they feel like they're not getting the best education possible, so that's why they go to other countries mm. and you know to get the better education. So we thought, you know, we'll go to, so we're going back to Canada, um, and uh, we've got all. By the time we had to get our papers all fixed up, we came here for holiday. Took one look around the place and said, "Why? Why would you be anywhere else?" <laughs> And stay, and but the reason what the reason we left was not only the children, but also we seven after seven years we do a cycle in life, and suddenly we it was no, all the novelty had been understood and learned. Now you're going to set a pattern for the rest of your life. And um, a friend of mine was a lawyer in Mexico City, and he said, "Ah, he says, look, I think you might be best to leave." And I said, "Why?" And he said, "Well, we Mexico has just discovered oil." and it's in such large quantities that all the foreign banks will come in and everybody will borrow up to the hilt on the money, future profits from interest, and then something will go wrong and the country will collapse and it'll be a mess. He said, that's the history of this place. We've been constantly you know, ruined by other countries. Oh, so I thought, well, everything being what it was, we left and came back here. And sure enough. There was an oil crisis in 70 or something or other. <laughs> and it they collapsed. And so, you know, it would have been terrible. Um, terribly difficult to get out of it. And you don't get into that sort of thing. We, it wasn't our world anyway. Um, we weren't, we didn't understand the depth of the culture. And if you stay there a long time, you have to really immerse yourself in the culture. And, and you could never, you could never understand that surrealistic world they live in. 
Mm. Um, surrealistic in so far as it's a cultural difference. It was so different to our world. Um, as much as I knew it, you know, you speak the language and you mix with the people and you do all those things, but you never, never get through that other layer. Mm. So, I mean, this is the place you understand most. Where you grew up, do you think? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think yeah, like they say, up to the age of seven or four, really, everything is. By the age of four, you're fixed. You, whoever you are at four is who you're going to be. By the time you get to seven, you really set in concrete, and after that, it's just adding on experiences and changing, you know, changing the things at the top. It's who you basically are is established <coughs> way back. So you came back to Brisbane. Did you want to go back to Conrad and Garda, for instance? Oh, or? very interesting. Um, well, Conrad and Garda was the only company I really knew about, and so uh, I uh, I went to Rob Gibson. Actually, uh, I thought I'd I'll try Rob Gibson before I will go to Conrad and Garda, and Rob Gibson offered me a job. Um, well. He sort of, I think he sort of offered me a job. And, uh, and then I went to Conrad and Gargett and, and it was like, oh, this was, I, I knew that. I knew, I could feel it much more familiar. And uh, so. Was Brent Gargett still there or not? Yes, yes. So I declined Robin. Um, and. Uh, I went to work with uh, you start, yeah, Lou again, basically. And then uh, made it with Lou pretty much the whole time, right? But how long did you stay there the second time? Uh, seven, six, seven, eight, about three years. Yeah, about three years. Yeah. And then? Then went, uh, joined up with Bill Heather and John Davis, the Davis Heavy Group, and uh, worked with them for a number of years. And that was Brisbane or Sydney? No, it was on the Tweed. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and um, and then after that, uh, um, Bill Heather and I um, started a company uh, in Circles. Well, sort of in Tweed, but then we went. In, had a base in circles, and that happened. That went along for ten or so years. Because John Davis went to Sydney, didn't he? And, and yeah, he did a hotel that I yeah, know about. Yeah, he, he worked on the um, Regent Hotel. Regent Hotel. Mm -hmm. yeah. So were you part of the firm then, or not? Yeah, 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 yeah. He, um, I think John, John's heart was in Sydney. I think he liked the cosmopolitan. Big city in nature of Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, is he still there? Mm? What became of him? Is he still there? I think so. I don't really know. Um, he uh, he had a place up on the Tweed for a long time, a little farm, and uh, and I really lost track of him after that. And he, and he got involved with with, Di with Michael Dyson. Michael yeah. Dyson sort of came in, there was actually a, an amalgamation of the company at one point with Michael Dyson. And uh, and that didn't last very long. And then uh, there were a couple of other sort of amalgamations. It was those times when people were trying, you know, things were changing and, and all sorts of amalgamations were taking place. Um, which still is, I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is there anything else that you were aware of as you travelled around the US? I mean, did you go to see the Boston City Hall, for instance? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did Boston over. Um, <coughs> loved that. Um, really, it, Boston um, was very English, because it, it has a mm -hmm. New England and all that sort of stuff. It has a very, um, it had a very familiar feel about it. I really liked Boston. California um, was very like San Diego and Gold Coast, or might as well be, you know, go 
goalpost and put your head in it. So, so similar in Australia. Uh, California, I had, we had a lot to do with California, um, then I left. And uh, also Texas and, and uh, New Mexico. We did a house in New Mexico actually for a, a guy, and it was in this big adobe. Um, it was built on like the old Pueblo style. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was very interesting. didn't have too much to do with the East Coast, mostly. We had a lot of clients from New York. We built a lot of houses for New York people. <laughs> it was hard going, <laughs> hard going. They were really uh, funny people. Some of them were fantastic, and some of them were really difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, difficult to understand insofar as they were so almost neurotic. <laughs> but that is not fair um, because um, they were just, they were travelling at a pace that was so fast and we were travelling at a pace that was so slow <laughs> that it seemed like they were like that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they weren't, but it just appeared. And what about in Mexico? Did you go to the Villegas and Calderwood's house and what other architects were oh, there? Yeah. What other architecture? Yeah. No, I, I've, I've, lost, I've lost this man's name. Uh, and we work with him, uh, the great minim minimalist Mexican American. Yeah. Yeah. You, you work with him? Yeah, um, in a in a somewhat strange sort of way. Um, Barragan was uh, he was a, a he was a, a leader in in the transformation of Mexican. Architecture from traditional into modern. It's okay. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. No water? No, no water. Um, and he, um, he, there was an area in Mexico City called the Pedregal, which mm -hmm. was uh, where all the modern houses built on the, you know, the Pedregal, mm -hmm. on, on the lava flows and so on. <coughs> we did a couple of houses there. And um, and we met we met him and we met um, and uh, then we got a, we had a we had a client who wanted to he was a lawyer and he wanted he had a hotel in uh, just south Mexico City in this Pueblo Pueblo no no not Pueblo. It'll come to mind. Play it about, not play it about. Anyway, he uh, had acquired this hotel that had been a very famous old house. It had been full of Rembrandts and all sorts of stuff. And the people, family died and he bought it out. And uh, so we redesigned this place into a more contemporary hotel. And this happened just at the time I left. So we contacted Barragan and said, would he like to have the job and to finish off and whatever have you. Had a little bit to do with him. And, and that was it. So it was very fleeting. But I knew his work and, and really, he was enigmatic. Um, he was a pure artist, sculpture. He was so Mexican that it was like, I couldn't, I couldn't, I can feel what he was about, but I couldn't find the words to describe it. But it was just knowing he was like one of the people who just was yeah. what he what he his work was what it was all about. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he was just perfect. And um, so we 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 did a proposal for the um, uh, Place Pompidou. Yeah. No, was called Place Pompidou. It was called um, Les Arles. It was built on old Les Arles. And so we always knew it as that. And when it became finally the Pompidou uh, Center, it, became, it was after we had put in a submission for the competition. I think it was called Center Beauburg. Beauburg. At, Beauburg. at the time. Yeah, that, that was the name of it. We, we knew it under. So we put in a, we did a thing for that. And, uh, and we 
we've got come out through the other aspects of the mystical city. But so we've worked with quite a range of people and, and uh, there are all sorts of um, you know, universities of the um, University of Mexico, Jalisco de Cebu, bits of that, but purely from a, not doing anything, but just sort of Im immersed into understanding why a lot of it has happened. And uh, actually, back in, uh, what I didn't mention back in uh, Vancouver, the other large project was um, Simon Fraser University. I worked on that with, um, it was at the latter stages of it, but it was a, a wonderful um, campus. So where is it? Simon Fraser is in uh, Vancouver. UBC, University of British Columbia, is the main university. Mm -hmm. And this new one, um, Simon Fraser, is right up on the hill mm -hmm. in the southwest, I believe. I think. And as I was back to front up there, because the sun set on the west, and I was over water, and that was opposite to here, I was had been back to front. But um, <coughs> the, the, it was a magnificent building, like a spine that, that, that flowed over the, the hill. And um, anyway, uh, I got this idea that it was because he'd worked so much in Japan, this is Arthur Erickson, he'd worked so much in Japan, I thought that, that he, this building had Japanese feel about it. And it so I used to say to people, ah, oh, he was inspired by Japan. And then one day he came here, Arthur Erickson came here on a visit to do a few lectures and I, so I took him out for supper and we caught up and and reminisced, and, and I mentioned this thing about Simon Fraser, and he looked at me and said, Japanese? No, 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 no. He says, it was from Monte Alban. I said, oh, when I was in Mexico, I went to Oaxaca, mm -hmm. and the, the ruins of Monte Alban that sit on this, this, this top of this hill, and he said, that's what inspired the Eastern Mexican pyramids and buildings. And uh, I thought, you know, I'd been there and, and had never made the connection. I had it wrong for all those years. And it took him to get set me straight years later, you know. So you just don't know, mm. you know, what's going on in some... He never actually mentioned that. So there's no way you understand what's going on in a person's head. Mm. And you make these assumptions and you have mm. all these opinions and mm. usually get it wrong. You know. Well, it's, um, that was what I thought about was wrong with our education, that we didn't ever discuss the basis of how you made design decisions. You just kind yeah. of, they came out of your head and yeah. no one ever spoke about where they came from yeah. or why you did things. True. Or if there was a philosophy that actually was Understood. related to mm. what you were deciding mm. to do. Very good point. Um, and that's, uh, and now you say that, you've actually answered the, my question that I've had most of my life. I could never understand why I remained a young man. And the reason was that there was no philosophical underpinning mm. to anything. Mm. And I was always looking for the, like everybody does, look for the meaning, you know, the connections, the relevance, the appropriateness and all that stuff. And ever since then, uh, the journey has been working on putting that together. And so everything that I have done since, I've tried to have an underpinning of the meaningfulness not very obvious and the message is lost in most, but it, it did have that need to be underpinned with something. And if those early lecturers had sat down and just talked about these basic principles that you mentioned, you know, the philosophical underpinning and the history and the need of, but basically the need of contemporary. Well, I don't think they could have. I don't think any, anyone there was capable of putting it all together like that. I mean, we didn't have that tradition of talking about mm. it. Therefore, it was almost like if you if you spoke about it, it, it destroyed this idea that it came, it was an original idea that you'd had. Right. You know, no one liked to say that they got something out of a magazine or yeah. they got an idea from somebody. Yeah. It was all it you was know, all in my head and it's mine. That's a, that's a very, very important point. In fact, it underpins so much of understanding about uh, what you're doing. Because this, an artist would say, 
I was inspired by Darling or Rembrandt or somebody else. Or nature. Or, or <laughs> nature, but, but no, 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 I, I had another artist influence me. I studied his work, I painted like him, so I got to know him. And then, when I went out, I went my own way, but I always understood what he was about and it made me feel like I'd grown up. I had added on to his history, that yeah. continuum again. Did you come to us, Ted? Ah, uh, nope. I don't know anybody back there. I know I'm not influenced by anybody. And there was this fear about being associated with having copied or been influenced by somebody else. It was almost this expectation that you had this divine spark that suddenly was the only thing that's ever happened was lit, which was totally impossible. But it just prevailed. And you felt like the expectations in design particularly were that you would do this all the time. And if you didn't, um, you know, well, you must have got out of the magazine, therefore you weren't really up to par. Well, what, to about, what about that little Frank Lloyd Wright-looking chapel? Were you embarrassed when people said that it was Frank Lloyd Wright derived? Or well, or like was a, that let the me, intention? Well, let me just put this in perspective. It wasn't me that introduced the Frank Lloyd Wright. I latched onto it because it was Frank Lloyd Wright. But there was a guy, Eddie Oribin, mm. in KN, who was, um, who took um, uh, Frank and studied and understood him and became sort of like a, not a disciple of Frank, but a, a, he was an interpreter of the essence of Frank. He understood what Frank Lloyd Wright was about. And he went his own way and produced some lovely, lovely buildings. Mm. And uh, um, this, there was this young guy, another oh, a very good friend of mine, who came from KM, and he had worked with, uh, with Eddie, and he said, why don't we do this? So he actually introduced the notion of the idea of Frank, and of course, more, as soon as he said Frank, it was like the light bulb came on, and we all... And it wasn't just me, it was, it was a few of us. But um, do you remember him? Yeah, I do. Uh, an Italian name, I think. Yeah, he's a lovely guy, but I can't really think of his name. Very good architect, and yeah, oh, terrible. I apologise for not remembering him. <laughs> but um, anyway, so, and then he, then that was then. Not, not Bob Cleland. Bob Cleland. Bob Cleland. Yeah, he wasn't Cleland. the one I was thinking of, but yeah, he no, did Bob come Cleland from Cairns, yeah. Was the guy. So Bob was really responsible for the spark of the idea. Um, then uh, he did one and I did one, and then we combined them, and then he went on to do some other job, and I took it on from there and did the, you know, all the design documentation along with Darby Munro. Remember Darby? Darby, yeah. Yeah, he did the, doc he did the drawing, and then I ran the job and built it. And um, I supervised, well, I did, and managed, managed the building process. But uh, so I, you know, I don't, I can't take authorship um, legally because of people. I just, I never. It was always Tommy and Gary's job anyway, it wasn't mm. me. But uh, but was Wright ever mentioned? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was obvious. Yes. And in fact, well, there's no question about it. We, you know, we were doing. Well, I. When it got to doing designing and doing it, I went for full right wing. Mm. So you know, I would have. But you had books, or uh, how did you do it? Yeah, some some books, but didn't didn't sort of. It wasn't. There was this fear about. Well, we just know about it, but we're not copying it. <laughs> like, <laughs> the same the same problem. Mm. You know, you you knew that this is what you should be doing, but you weren't supposed to be doing that because you know it wasn't original. So anyway, what. Where we were grounded, I think where we were brought down to earth very quickly, it was built and it's a lovely little thing and, and so on. It went into, there was a magazine put out by Queensland University called Queens Arch Architect, Queensland Architect or something like that. It was a little magazine put out by the Institute or the in University mm -hmm. and it had this article, this photograph of it, and it had this article written by someone like John Dalton. Somebody, I don't know who it was, and 
or I could probably find out. And he said, well, I mean, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to be inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright, you might as well go right back to the source. In other words, he was saying, you know, this is a copy of Frank Lloyd mm. Wright, mm. but at least they had the courage to go right back mm. and not reinvent mm. or try, you know. So I always took that as two things. I it was a, a slap in the face <laughs> as being a criticism. This is what your ego responds to. But the other thing was saying that this guy was actually tell, teaching you something by saying this. He was saying, y yes, it was a copy, mm. but at least you you gave the original author the credit of having an influence on you, mm. you know, to acknowledge him uh, in the right way because it was it was a beautifully frank detailed sort of thing. It was mm. But it wasn't a copy of any particular building, mm. was it? Or was it? No, no, it wasn't. Although I did find, and this is funny, but I did find later on uh, and may have actually been inspired without my knowledge by... by uh, by Bob, but it, it, I think it has a, a Unitarian, remember the Unitarian church he did? Well, it looks like that, mm. uh, to some degree. I, uh, well, I didn't really, <laughs> I found all this out later, and, and I thought to myself, well, if I'd gone here in the first place, I would have saved a lot of heartache trying to <laughs> make it up, you know. But, so that was um, probably the only time, the only job I've ever done in my life that was like an imitation mm -hmm. uh, but it was um, it was flattering I mean you know I, was fla I flattered Frank Lloyd Wright I mean the reality not me. is he was flattered by us you know. the reality is you get given a very small amount of time to make a decision about well what's this building going to be like yeah well, like three days I think yeah. mm -hmm. I think and so it was very spontaneous so but um, and someone I mean whether it was or whether it was a Japanese or whether it was modern or whatever, it was going to have, it was going to be related to some style or other, right. mm. somewhere, and it happened to be this. So, were you I aware, for instance, of the building it was replacing, which was the the chapel for yeah. the Archbishop in Milton? Yes. Well, no, there wasn't one. What Fr what Brendan did was he designed one. There was no chapel there. Oh, but there had been. The Archbishop used to live. At Bishop's Bourne at yeah. Milton, and there was a chapel oh, there. Oh, no, no, this this is not Bishop's Bourne, this is Star. Oh, I know, this yeah. is the new Bishop's Bourne. Oh, I but see. It was the equivalent building. Yes. No. Are you yes. aware of it? No. The answer is no. <laughs> no, I did. And it all happened so quickly, we didn't have a chance to find out anyway. Mm. And I did subsequently find it with Robin Dodd, wasn't it? Mm. Yes. And it was a lovely little church, and I looked at it and thought, why couldn't we have done something as nice as this? <laughs> well, I think you but did. Then, you know, it's a very self-conscious sort of, I, you know, it's been something that's, it's always bounced around inside me. It's like, I'm not sure whether it was a good thing or not, but there it is. Yeah, but I mean, you, you were at a, an age where, how could you question it? I mean, you're given yeah. an opportunity to do something, you've got a couple of days to get it together and you draw on whatever exactly. you can. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which is really interesting because, you know, people now, you know, toward the end of my life, I, I used to feel like I was getting a bit old fashioned because I couldn't, I couldn't deconstruct on the computer. You know? I could, I got into deconstruction, but that's as far as it got. Mm. And, uh, but I'd really got um, postmodernism. I sorted that out. Yeah, right. yeah, not many people did. <laughs> no, I did two postmodern buildings, and uh, I'm not too sure whether. <laughs> I mean, history is gets very cruel on past styles. Well, they do for a while, but yeah. then it comes but into its own again. I'll, I'll tell you one one very, um, <coughs> very interesting example here, and um, uh, there was a I organised a convention, an art state convention one year. Uh, what year? 70, uh, 76, 77, mm -hmm. 78, something like that. There was a state convention and they asked me to convene it. And um, so uh, when it was uh, part of it, we had all these speakers and one of them was Graham Dabucci. And 
and Graham got up and was working on his, th on his PhD, which is about buildings in Queensland. Mm -hmm. I think this is actually written. I think that's right. yeah, that came out as a result. I, th I think that's the paper. I might be wrong, but um, anyway, he, I, <laughs> with Conrad and Gaia, and going to uh, Tasmania, what went through the other one in Queen Street, which is on the side of the old. Um, was an old cap cafe, a famous cafe. Um, um, yeah, um, not Rose, but no, um, a famous milkshake, milk, yeah. uh, milk bar cafe. Um, it's been chocolates. in Brisbane for decades and it's famous. Yeah. yeah, it'll come back anyway. So it, we pulled that down, we discovered <laughs> all the rats <laughs> have been living there for centuries. It was an amazing discovery of how the city works under the city because they unearthed mm -hmm. all these. Open sewers, and there were there were freeways of rats, <laughs> freeways coming in. They were stopping at intersections and were like watching, <laughs> watching this electronic freeway. Um, so anyway, we built this thing, which has now, which was then demolished to make way for the expansion of um, taps. That's right. Yeah. So, but it was a it was an interesting little building, but it was very. It was it all came out of the Mexico experience. Forms and shapes. And it had a very organic ceiling. I yeah, think. it was very. It was a nice, nice little building. A lovely interior. And black bean. Hmm? Black bean. Oh, that stuff? probably was. Yeah, wow. was somewhere. Anyway, um, uh, it was condemned by Robert, by, by um, Robin uh, Gibson. Gibson didn't like it. Um, and I can understand that. Um, a lot of people didn't like it, and I can understand that. But it happened. There, there it was. Graham Gabucci, and I think I've got this right, and Graham may have given me up on that, and maybe I got it wrong, and I apologise if I have. But he was talking about buildings, and he said, Oh, he said, and he used this building as an example. He said, This is, a, this is the first postmodern building in Brisbane, or well, one of the first, and it's got all the postmodern uh, elements of this and that, and, and so on. And he described this, I didn't even even know what the word postmodern meant. I didn't know what he was talking about. And I sort of thought, oh my God, you know, this guy's talking about something and, and I, about this building, I don't know. And then I realised, hang on, it's my <laughs> I should know that I was my building. Well, you know, I was sort of responsible for most of it. And so I got a bit embarrassed and I thought, boy, what's going on here? And uh, then afterwards I thought about it and realised that yes, it did have all the postmodern sort of things, but had not come from, and I didn't know even who the postmodern architects were, or from a movement, nothing, because I'd just arrived in the country. This was like six months after getting back from Mexico, where I'd been isolated mm -hmm. for seven years from the rest of the world, you know, because, uh, you know, international mm -hmm. And this movement had come along and I didn't even know about it. And, uh, and it was all like this, you know, this, uh, totally influenced by Mexican stuff. Mm. <laughs> and, I got, and I thought, it's so interesting that someone looks at something and they recognise something and then they, there's a, a narrative takes place in their mind of how they see it and interpret it. And what he was saying is, if I hadn't, if I was the only person sitting in that room that knew that what he was saying was his own narrative, because he'd never spoken to me. Mm -hmm. No one had ever asked me, and I'd never told anybody. No one even knew where it came from or anything about it. It was just like this building, you know, it just popped up. And so I thought, this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I never did get to ever have a chat to Graham. And, um, I thought, no, if that's what he's seen, and that's what he gets out of it, that's, I'm not going to mess with that. So, you know, who am I to? What, what were the other postmodern buildings? You said two. Oh, um, uh, no, that was the first one. Then he was one. Um, oh yeah, All Hallows. All Hallows, which, right. I, which I can see you know from my living room. <laughs> oh, you do. Okay, yeah. right. So that was the other one, um, and that was uh, that was quite deliberate yeah. postmodern. And the reason for it was that um, 
the site, and this was this was interesting, I, I realized this afterwards, that I went around the site, when we were asked to do it, and I walked around and I discovered yeah. that on the old Hallows land, yeah. there was a building to represent every decade from about 1880. Yeah. And you could pick them, um, and I went around and made a note of them, 1880, 90, yeah. you know, 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 60, 50, 70, and this was 1980, and there was the last piece of land, and it was on the top of a cliff, and you could even hang over the cliff. And uh, this was 1980, so I thought, yeah. well, this is a gallery <laughs> of the decade. Yeah. It has to have has to be a 1980 building. I mean, it could be anything, you know. It could have looked like the old building, and I just that was the yeah. reason it was because at that time, the 1980s postmodernism was the big was the style. And all these others were about styles. Yeah. Each was a style. You could tell the decade yeah. by the style. Yeah. But the style was important as a document, as a, as a I call it a timepiece. And so you can completely justify the style of architecture as being of historical importance to identify the decade. And uh, so it was un unashamedly 1980s, postmodern in, in every respect. But the big trick was it had the most important thing was it had it was basically a big box that had to be an auditorium and a gymnasium. And acoustically there were no two further separated requirements. Um, the yeah. auditorium had to be silent yeah. and I had to be no, had to had to be able to, to you know yeah. deal with sound. And the um, and the basketball court had to be absolutely dead. So it was a kind of, it was a, the, the trick was to make it a dead building one morning, and the afternoon it was a live building without doing anything. Mm -hmm. they look good. So it turned out um, it worked apparently, and uh, I went to the opening, when we first opened it, and um, the uh, they were sitting on stage talking, and you could hear everything right up right up the back. You could hear everything that was being said, and then they played basketball or something, and it was not quite good. And it was just the way you listen to it. Mm. Well, what do you think of what Daryl did on its roof? What's that? Daryl Jackson came along and put something on its roof. Was that Daryl Jackson? I didn't know who it was. He put a big... Well, actually, you see, this is another interesting thing about architecture. When it was done, they said, can we have the top as a future tennis court? So I said, I have no idea what the future tennis court's going to be, but it was a tennis court, sort of, but it was a big flat deck that could be made a tennis court. So it had an art studio, it had art studio in the basement. Then it had the auditorium and and uh, and um, um, gymnasium in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then the roof was a tennis court or outdoor area. And then it had this big stair down the front, which was a fire escape. So when I saw this thing going up, I thought, ah, does one get upset? about someone messing with your building? Or do you say, that's life? Yeah. You know, things evolve and change. Um, what do you do? Do you go do you contact the client? And so I just said, no, this is none of my business. It's not my building. Uh, he should have contacted me, I felt. Well, it was moral rights. He had issue. Well, it was also now legal. But Anyway, he didn't, he didn't, and for whatever reason, I don't hold that against him, because I, I wasn't upset. I thought, no, I'll, I'll just stand back and observe how he deals with it, yeah. whether he does a good job. That was my, my only approach was, I'll just evaluate what he does to what was already there. I won't, I'll take myself out of the picture. So I saw it, and, and I was befuddled for a while, and, and I never quite came to terms with it, except I can see what he's done and why he's done it. I understand it all. Without it, I never actually have been into it. But I can, I can, I know what's there. I mm -hmm. can see it, because I can think how the architect would think. And I thought, well, after all, it, that's what it was meant to be. And if they'd come to me and said, put a covered tennis court, what would I have done? Who knows, I might have done that. I have no idea. So um, I just accept that as being, that's how life is. And architecture is evolving. Buildings are recycled. Mm -hmm. you know, 
remember the blue shock is all there anyway. So you can't get let your ego get in the way of of life. It's just the way it is. So I've been neutral about it, but frankly I have no I don't like it or dislike it. Um, because I can't like it because it's not part of the building or the way that I understand. But I can't dislike it because it was gonna happen anyway. Yeah, I mean, you could have done it in a way that, I suppose, paid it more respect. I mean, it's like, to me, it always looked like a big hamburger bun had been put on top of it and they squashed it. And well, I, yes, I went through all that. I went through all that. And I thought, yeah, I can say all those things. Then what? It's like, I can, I can, it's very strange, that's just, you know, I just accept it. Um, I don't, I, not what I would have done. I mean, I wouldn't have had that shape, but anyway. How are we going for time? Um, the recording has 13 more minutes, but you have to do it in two parts. So. Oh, okay. Well, um, other questions. When, when you were studying architecture, who did you think was interesting at the time? And then after you came back from being abroad, who you think was doing good building for you? Back yeah, I've, I've, I've jotted down a couple. Um, uh, yeah, which building is built, built between mm -hmm. 1945 and 75? Well, the SGAO building, I thought mm -hmm. was a significant building. Well, it, it's had an uh, unhappy ending. Have you seen it lately? No. Mm. Someone's <laughs> oh. done a job on it. Okay, well. You know, some people end up with walkers and glasses <laughs> and hearing aids. And, um, the Barsley Chapel, I always thought that was a little one of the Archbishop Chapel. Um, because it's always been interesting in that it's, it's always been a land you couldn't, no one can can do anything with it. No, it's, it's just as it is now, mm -hmm. in a way. I thought the Commonwealth Bank in its day was a was a fairly important, mm. um, a very important public building, and it in a very public space, and it it set back to allow the space of that intersection, mm. which was very simple, mm. restrained, and I thought it was a what I would call a good mannered building. Mm. It, it it has a, a timelessness about it. It's been up there now for fifty years, whatever it is. And it still doesn't look like it's an old ancient building. It's 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 such a it's part of. The I would agree. It's very nice old building. Mm -hmm. um, I always like to tell the two of Tasmania and two of the old. Um, I've had three buildings knocked down now. Now you start. Now you start <laughs> making a list of the buildings that get knocked down. But you've got mm, pictures of them. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, but it's like you go. Yeah, that's right. My friends are dying. <laughs> um, oh, and, and Peter Heathwood's house at End of Clear, I always thought that was a, mm -hmm. was a very good example. And, uh, oh, his house, I rather like. What, what date is this house? 1979, 80. It's old. I mean, I built this and I had no money. I couldn't afford it. And uh, you know, it had to be built in a bit of a hurry and blah blah blah. Um, if I was building it again today, I'd build it exactly the same way. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it didn't matter because you didn't, didn't have no, money. It's just interesting. Um, th that's why it's not rendered brickwork because I couldn't afford to render. But I like the texture and the quality mm -hmm. of the brickwork. It gave it. It felt like a skin. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't bland, it was but uh, the interesting thing is it's had young children, teenagers, old children, like adult children, and it's had young children again, plus their parents, and it's had all these generations and parties of six, a hundred people, and nothing changed. It just like it swallows it all up, you know. And there's two doors in the house, and it was very. Absolutely, and everything seems to work. I have no idea why. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was from 
they do. It was, a, it was a, the most terrible fight I've ever had in my hands. It, it fought me all the way. Because doing something for someone else in life, that's just very easy. You just do it. Mm. Right? I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> you, have to, you struggle with it. But it, the, the brief is clear that you need to be careful. When it comes to your own house, you have to be quiet. Mm. Too yeah. many things, to, too many decisions. Anyway. Because now you mentioned Conrad Gargett, Peter Heathwood, but were there other architects from well, that period that you... International, local? Both. Okay, well, the internet, like, the people that really influenced my life, um, well, the local people who were in the student years was Lou, Lou Howard, Brendan Gargett, John Bolton, Kenzo Kane, Frank Lloyd Wright, Richard Neusser, and, and Gaudi, and mm. Samuel Gaudi. Mm. That was a pretty diverse group. Mm. Yeah, and <laughs> now... Um, the people that have influenced me generally are Arthur Erickson, mm. Frank Lloyd Wright, Zuri, and Tara Prada. Mm. Mm. And they all, you know, if you see, mm. you read all that and you say, oh, you know, he's got a bit of a straight line in his body. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bent. <laughs> so, but that's it. Uh, and, and uh, well, Le Corbusier is not in there. Is he yeah, I have, trouble with, I have trouble with him. Um, some reason. Uh, I love what he did and all that, but but he tried too hard. He was he was too much um, he wasn't I mean he's with all of his modular and everything else was and all of those things were, were sort of organic, but he tried too hard to put everybody in a box. When when I studied his modular I thought he's trying to force us into a into a, a box which that is not as flexible and I know he's had module, you know, to yeah. do all these things, but somehow or other it wasn't free enough to, ex to take the odd cyclone that came through. Did you believe him? No. What? Ah. Wrong. I never thought about whether I believed him or not. I, well, I didn't believe him, I just thought, you know, he, he, what he's doing, he's doing for whatever reason. And he's, he's having he's, fun. He's trying to justify it and say, this is what I'm doing. He was really... But that's nonsense. He was really a cubist painter. Um, and he tried to, you know, invent architecture. Mm. Uh, it wasn't the architect. His architect, I felt, didn't come, didn't come from where it's mm. supposed to come from. It came as a manufactured thing. Mm. That's just my opinion. I, uh, but something didn't quite connect with me. That's all. But mm. Barrigan, you spoke of, you respect. Barrigan. Barrigan. Yeah. Oh, Barrigan is another. Barrigan. One. <laughs> Barrigan. <laughs> Um, now he's not so dissimilar in some ways, or is he? You see, I understood his spirit, and his spirit was right there. But if you looked at all of his mm. plain walls, and you say, but he's a modernist, hardline, but it was all about the space created by the wall. Mm. It, was the, it was the warmth or whatever was the colour that he used, the primary colour. So he was... He was for me, the sort of ethereal architect that was an enclosed architect, which is basically about enclosing space, he was enclosing space but leaving the roof off, mm. if I can put it that way. Um, and so that's why I, I, I felt very strongly. So I wouldn't, I'd have the courage or the grit to do exactly that, but I felt it. So did you ever go to a Corbusian's building, experience it in three dimensions? Ah, now there is one uh, that I never got to. Um, one or two that I never got to. Um, Longchamp, mm. I think, is one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. And if ever he, if ever a building sort of came from somewhere profound, that would have been. So you weren't tempted. Did you know about Longchamp when you did the other chapel? The no. no. If you had it, would that have been a stronger yeah. inspiration? Yeah. It would have. Mm -hmm. I would have been compulsively wheeled into that <laughs> view of life. I, I, would have, I would have been influenced here, absolutely. absolutely. Although it was beginning 
I was still trying to figure who it, what, you know, what life was all about. And did you ever go to a Wright building when you were yeah, travelling? Yeah, Taliesin West, um, and a couple of these houses, Mo uh, his, um, um, not Monty Hazard, uh, his, um... Prairie? Prairie houses? No, I, I, didn't, I didn't get to a Prairie house. Eastwood. I mean, was he someone you knew? No. No, I just liked, I just liked his style. But you probably, I mean, that house, um, I can't remember the name of the house now, it was well published. Yeah. So yeah. everyone knew it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, there wasn't a lot of stuff published, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, uh, he hasn't got the name either. Mm. I, I didn't really, it just, that's as much as I ever associated with him. I, I heard him speak a couple of times. And just something about him, and I thought he was a quality man, and, and um, you know, he was someone that you put in, you sort of put in your list of people that I must yeah. always try and make sure I respect. Sure. Or, or whatever. Well, Dalton, what about him? Did um, I have any contact with no, him? No, no, he was purely, um, I didn't really want to, um, I, I don't know, I just didn't, didn't really associate with the man. Uh, from a personal, you know, my makeup and his makeup, I didn't think we would find common ground so much. So I didn't make any effort to get in touch with him, although I, although I respected him immensely. Um, because I thought he was a someone who'd just been out and did it. Um, you know, and, and some things that were a new, fresh, approach to things and, and uh, simple materials and I just thought it, I could see I could see the intellect in what he was doing as being um, all in his own mind but a lot of the things that he did were the same thing over and over I mean he didn't yeah, that's reinvent all right. that's all right. his buildings he did a kind of like he started off doing houses that were like Hazen Scott houses yeah. and then he changed at some point to doing houses that he did. Yeah. And he did lots of them. Yeah. He was a jeweler. He was just refining, you know, had a, had a style and he just refined it, refined it. Whereas Don Spencer, everyone was a complete reinvention of everything. Yeah, I know. I know people like that. And did you have any feelings about what Spencer was doing? I knew Don Spencer. I knew his brother, Kevin. Kevin, yeah. I like Kevin a lot. Don was working on his brother for a while. And um, I just, when I knew him then, I just felt that he was um, irrepressibly um, exploring um, what he didn't know he did. It. I didn't know he did anything. I didn't really associate too much with what he did personally. But um, you're right, yeah, you just you couldn't nail him down. Well, he was just an inventor of yeah. stuff. Yeah, I know. Every, every, I mean, it, they don't always work the first time you do them either. Yeah. So you got into a lot of trouble, I think. Yeah, yeah, it took a lot of risk. But what about then firms like uh, Caro Nutter and Charlton? Well, um, they were... Um, uh, I worked with, well, you know, that was, uh, I knew, I knew Danny Nutter, um, only vaguely. He, Danny was in sports, really into sports. Mm -hmm. He had a, a golf, he was sort of very exact and very extrovert and, um, you know, in that most of us would have done. And, uh, I didn't really ever see anything that he did personally in, in that business. Um, but uh, uh, the brother who worked with him, he was, I guess he was um, a Dean. I mean, I worked with him on occasion, and he was a nice respect to me, only because I'd worked with him on and on. I had immense respect for Danny, but I never worked with him for any common thing like that, for Danny or anything. But, but he and I, Ian was a, one of these incredibly thorough, honest, 
spread out in the flight. Mm. Mm. What you see is what you get. And he knew what he's talking about. He knew the right thing. He, he, <laughs> I just remember they, he got the scholarship to go, the book scholarship to go overseas and study with the computers to make maps. Here's the money, go have a, have a holiday, right? <laughs> not, not Ian. Ian goes and he <laughs> writes up all the notes, takes photographs, writes reports, and he comes back and he presents to them this amazing, you know, analysis of what he'd seen and done. And he said to me, he said, I think he's correct, he said, I, I looked at this and said, why did you do all this? We didn't expect you to do all this. And he said, but I couldn't not do it. <laughs> Very, very um, studious guy, very observing and independent. Mm. He was a very good teacher. I mean, I remember him very fondly from mm. the days at uh, QIT, where he was my oh, really? design lecturer with um, Neville Lum. Oh, really? Oh, you yeah. were very lucky. Yeah, he would. He would. I never knew him as a teacher, um, but he would be a wonderful teacher and uh, Neville Lund, he, he and Neville Lund together would be a, you would have had a very good, mm. a very good basis for that. And yet they were the days when you felt that you could be uh, conscious of this unrest in sort of the student world and, and the in wanting to be more than just an architect, you know, you wanted to take part in stuff like university reviews were happening, you know, that was that was just as important as going to listen to some <coughs> guy down yeah. at George Street. So mm -hmm. you went off and you spent your time at St. Luthor rehearsing something or whatever mm -hmm. and took part in that and then came back to your lectures and said, well, we've been doing this, but, you know, we'll catch up and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll mm -hmm. hand in on time and stuff and we might be a week late because of that. And they didn't really think of it, you know, just as a dumb thing. You know, <laughs> they just sort of said, oh, you know, you're not being serious. You know, just mm. and then that <laughs> just sort of fed the dissatisfaction but even further. Yeah, but you can see the difference between your environment and our environment in those few years. The difference, mm. you know, we didn't. We were very encouraged in the environment, and oh. I thought very sterile. I mean, I didn't spend much time on my assignments. I used to do them at lunchtime before they were, you know, the yeah, lunchtime before they were handed yeah, in. Yeah, but see, you're very talented. This is a problem for you. <laughs> it's easy for you. <laughs> what do you mean? I you get all, you get. You were twice as good as I was. No, I doing was doing that stuff. I'm, I'm but you were doing it for the fun. You were doing it for real. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they but were it building was building what you did. But I'm sure it was harder work than all that. I have to, I have to really work it. Nowadays. Um, now I've learned. I've learned. I've got into um, understanding the automotive, the intuitive drawing and writing and so on. And I re I discovered just about six months ago that I've been doing it mo doing this most of my life and didn't realize, didn't know what it was. And um, so I just wrote a little book about it. And uh, in doing so, discovered um, why. What's the difference between um, a person that just pops it out and a person that really labours it out? And there's a very, um, I think, but this is from what, from what I can gather, it's a very simple um, consequence. And the fact is that it just gets back to, everything gets back to the fact that you sit on this view and you write what you like, you know, you're logical and you're analytical and you're creative and you're intuitive. And um, they're wired together. You know, if any, if you try and balance into <laughs> any two systems that are electrical and chemical and get them to work in sync, and the whole idea is if you get them perfectly balanced, you are an individual who can deal with intuitive things and deal with logic like switch over, channel, deal with this, deal with that, deal with this, deal with that. But 99% of us have a favor bias I think one way or the other in other words this side works a little quicker and better and more clearly than this side which is defines who you are and so if you're one of these and there's 
cloud side, then the intuitive stuff comes very easy to us. And then depending on how far you are into that hemisphere, it depends on how easy the split and vice versa. Mm. And so you have, you know, Zinjin and the Arctic, and if you want a very simple analogy, the people of the region who re rely on sequence and those who rely on um, random access and, you know, like a computer or a phone or a computer or the hardware, <coughs> you know, anybody that's thinking of the, soft the mind of the software, but then something has to write software, and that's the mysterious bit. But, um, and the other, and, and I, I give a few lectures at Brown, and one of them was on, as I said, some girl at a lecture on automatic writing, or automatic drawing. And that's when I first realized that such a thing existed, and I got into it, I was thinking about it. And I described it to them very simply as that, that, the, um, that the intuitive thinking starts here leaps into space. It takes a lot of courage and bravery to do it first time after you get used to it like riding a bicycle. And you get out there and you run. And the whole universe passes you by. <laughs> and when the right one comes, you latch on. And it's the right one. And it's there. The sequential thinker, the logical thinker, starts here and decides where they want to be and makes a series of steps to get there. And each one of those steps is a, is a research thinking inspired, you know, humble and Philadelphia really to get there. And when you get there, if it's right, it's right, and you've got a, a trail that you can teach other people with, because it's all there. But if it's the wrong one, you've got to come back and start all over again. And so each has the benefit, the benefit of, the, of this one, is that it's a trail that is easy to learn and to teach. Um, the problem is that it may be the wrong assumption. You have to make sure the assumptions are right. The other one is that it's always right, but getting the ability to do that with this set of mechanisms and believe that and to trust in it is the hard bit, the very difficult bit. It becomes very difficult. And it's called back to that theory again. It's called, but it's basically the it's it's basically the hemisphere where they split. Now that's a very simple crude narrative, <laughs> but it's made it easy for me to see that that's what happens with people. And you get the person comes along, and, and you can see where they fit in one of these hemispheres. You know that they are a very logical very strong person and just knows what how you got there and what to do and they you know, make that very clear legally so which one do you think you are well I think I'm probably a bit on the strange one of the leaps into space sort of thing but at the same time you know I love I love the Zulu I love the I love the Chinese world so okay, you've done a bit of both a bit of both but I'm not I'm not I'm not that well known but it's but it does it does make it easy to understand it's all about getting to understand who you are and what you do where you come from and what you want to do and what you'll be good at once you understand these systems it makes it a lot clearer for you to plot your path and to actually achieve things because you get to know that that's not in my sphere or that's my, my capacity my sphere of influence or whatever else doesn't suit that I'll have to get to someone else for someone else to do it. And the decision to get someone else to do it for you, you know, which means that they become an ego, and I keep mentioning this because this is an important aspect of the ethnology. But if you do that, um, then you get life again because you can have no trouble saying, I did get it. But if you've got a huge ego, I'm not going to ask him because I know better, even though I know I don't know. I'll pretend I don't, and then pfft, you know, so I'll find out. So it's, but it's a very, it's a very good thing for young people to, to get to learn how these things, basic principles work. Because if you learn those, then it's easier to practice them and be familiar with what you're doing. So he's sort of comfortable with knowing that. Mm. Yeah. Well, just thinking 
back on the people who were working at Conrad and Gargut when you were there those six years, I mean, not too many of them were ever allowed to design things. Mm. There was only a few. And I mean, I, I never saw any of the partners, I mean, certainly not Ben Gargut, I never saw him do anything that looked like a drawing. Mm. You've described some that he's done. Well, I was the only one I ever saw. And, um, and, and that was a unique, I think that was a, a pretty much a unique. Charlie Hamilton seemed like an artistic sort of a person, but I never saw anything that he did. Did you? No. Nope. No. And then Bill Conrad? No. No. And Peter, no. Peter, no. So. Mind you, that their role in life was. Oh, yeah, they had other responsibilities. Yeah, they were Everyone yeah. can't be that. Yeah. I understand I'm not criticising yeah. them, but I'm just saying that the people that, that you find, or I found interesting, were the people who actually were working with the ideas that yeah. created yeah. A, a, a part of architecture, which is a very small part of it, really, but an essential part. And Frosty certainly was in control of his little world, and he... he produce buildings and he said they will be like this and they were like that mm. and you were doing them and and you talked about Lou Haley sort of allowing that to happen in a very free way yeah he, he could and he did but I saw a few things he did and he could do it very easily mm. but I think he was uh, he was to me and I've heard this from other people since he has been a wonderful example to follow. Mm. He's a teacher, a natural teacher, and a natural guidance um, officer. <laughs> what I, I can't find a nicer word, but he was—he's really like an inspirational person. And I've—I've I've met people in the world of copying, and I used to say, "Oh, so he was such a wonderful." He's taught me so many things that I've found from it. I listen back and go, "Oh." He, he could. I think he understood people so well. He knew that he could trust and use and do something and he did. I saw a house um, only recently that he had designed, or I was told he designed it for the Hoey out of um, right. Brookfield Road, Penmore. And I thought it was a beautiful house yeah. that I'd never heard of it or or that Lou did things like mm. that, because he wasn't really designing well things. Well, his own house, though, you see, he's, that was the only one I ever saw of him. Well, me too. And, and, and that was, you know, like a, a brilliant solution. Uh, and it's still there. And, mm. and hopefully we'll get to look at it yeah, <laughs> quite yeah, soon. Yeah. Yeah. So many inspirators have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to having lunch with him one day. I know, I know mm. his circumstances. 30 years ago because I really have spoken to him too much. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've asked him a few times would he um, come to things and he said, oh, look, I spend my weekends to the Gold Coast and I'm always to the coast. I'm not really interested anymore. I thought, mm. you know, there are enough things on mm. TV. I said, okay. <laughs> yeah. I came as a guest of Tim Martin for three days and then for a couple of weekends. Mm. Anyway, that's, that's, accept all of that. Yeah. I think right. question mark here. Yep. It's more of a very nice question. Unless oh. you have something. Oh, gee. What, what, I mean, were you aware of people like Carl Langer? Yeah. Did you, yeah. Were you taught by him? No. No. Um, Carl Langer was like the invisible guru. Um, he was, everybody talked about him, but never saw him. I mean, I wasn't at the FBU, so I didn't, he was, he was at the FBU? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I didn't come across him, only because of geography. But um, I never, I mean, the Broadbridge Hotel that he did was um, interesting, but it was like his time was almost up. Mm. He was becoming, in, his relevance was being overtaken by mm technology and lifestyle and commerce and everything else. That's what I felt. 
Well, the main roads department building, um, which is probably the biggest thing that we left, um, if you, you, you know, it was just down the road from Conrad and Gargut's office. You couldn't help but see it. But I mean, what did you think of it? I can't even visualise it. I'm sorry. I didn't. I'm not being disrespectful. I think just that I. Um, no, I, I. At the time, I was. I was only interested in spectacular things. You know how as a student you just. You know you're cr you're trying to crawl above what it, what's around you, and so you look for overseas stuff to start anything you haven't seen before. Yeah. And what's there in front of you can be beautiful and all that, but you're not interested at that, that age because you're looking for exciting things. And what about this building that was on the corner of Upper Edward Street by Oswald, Frank Oswald? Yeah. Glen Crag. Yeah. Do you remember that? No. I mean, I, I remember. Oh, it. hang on. Yes, I do. Yeah, I can remember. I, kn I Yeah. For 20 years, I'm not going to say that. But now I do remember, yeah. Because I didn't like it. I no, just I thought, yeah. God, this guy needs calming down a bit. <laughs> yeah. He's got every kind of material, yeah. and colour and texture. Yeah, no, I, see, the thing is, a lot of that sort of stuff, at the time I thought, I don't understand it. That's probably because I'm not very smart. Because right. you when you're young, you think you mm. don't know much. Mm. And it's very easy to say, uh, well, you know, somebody who's smarter than me probably knows what they're talking to talk about that, but they do because of experience. Mm. So you get confused as when you're young about the difference between knowledge and experience. And well, look, there's a few other buildings that were important for Brisbane that are kind of in here that you might have an opinion about. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't like, I don't have much, opinions bother me because opinions are opinions. Oh, well, but <laughs> even you remember, I mean, when the student conference was on, they had their, yeah. the head of the, I mean, that yeah. was considered to be a showpiece piece of architecture yeah. in Eagle Street, yeah. and that's where the the um, conference office was. Yeah. Which building? It was um, Hammerson's building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well it's, just, it's just another building to me. That's why it's not even called Hammerson. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'm confused. I, but I mean, these were these were these were to me these were these were engineer designs. I know there were architects and so you know, I know there was Peter Thorpe and so on. But but to me it was like it was dictated by engineering outcomes. And this one, Pearl, which is Pangolin yeah. Cross. Yeah. Not much. I, I they don't. Uh, See that it's all about proportions of these these things, yeah. And some of them, like, you know, this, these things are equal, and so that bothers me. Um, yeah, uh, it's like it has no rhythm to it. Well, Conrad and Gargett produced this one with the works department. This one, yeah. Which um, uh, is likely to get knocked down very soon. Yeah, so I believe. Um, do you think um, it's do you think it's a good building? Well, I tell you why. I, what I like about this is it's articulated with shadow, that it's got it's got some depth. It's got a little bit of rhythm about it. See that other one, like mm. this this sort of building, it's just it might as well be curtain wall without mm. any. It's got no articulation. No, it has no l no direction. It has no light and shade. It has no this one I feel, you know, I know that how difficult it was to produce these things in architecturally because I know the sorts of clients that went through it yeah. and, you know, you're tied, you're screwed down, there's nothing much more you can, nothing much you can do. So it's very difficult and I empathise with that. But with this one, at least you had, um, you had a variety of, 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 of space, like lines. Yeah. Proportions were Proportions, better. Proportions, much better. It actually had a serrated edge, so it had a you know a much better. Profile. I just yeah, yeah. I find that to be a much more um, much more acceptable looking building than that. Okay, yeah. Um, Bob Collin talked about that one. He worked on it at Conrad and Gargan. Oh yeah. And he said it was very like 
Ken Woolley's great office building in Sydney, which is mm. the, the same oh, sort well. of pattern, but a very different proportion of yeah. rooms. Oh, well, if that's in that case, it's a good thing to find. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> yeah. But I just wondered whether anyone ev ever realised that, yeah. whether that was true or whether well, that was... Well, the last building, in fact, the last building I worked with in Conrad and Gargan, believe it or not, was... Um, uh, Edward and To get that thing, any interest in it all was like was just beating your head against a brick wall. It was very, very difficult. And uh, <laughs> in the end, I said, "Well, it was just can we?" I'll tell you what. I was the bottom has a, a had aluminium tips, aluminium handles, and so I used these um, tin towels. <laughs> well, you know, they had the the way that sort of the bottom of the tin towels and the uh, they came down and then they spread out like a, like a steel and uh, so there was a sort of a variation of that so they had a, a base that grew at the end and that Tucker did that then he tried to have a round and parapet and that was like inventing something from outer space <laughs> you know and then the then the big one was that the whole awning was glass, and there wasn't a glass awning. I think Robin Gibson had one. And Robin Gibson did one on the Milano restaurant. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That was the only other one. So, oh no, it was, it was Tasmanian Timothy I had one. And anyway, so I wanted to put this, but I, I even made a, I was making models. Yeah. And I made this sort of, one night I made this whole detail of this thing, like the work. And uh, oh, oh, phew, boy, that really, that just was like the end of it. Sorry. Bang. No, don't have that. Who, who's doing that? Oh, this was not Ian. Ian was promoted. Ian wanted it. You know, he said, well, you know, anything, anything that can make this thing interesting, you know. And so it wasn't just anything. We really thought it through. And Ian was integral in all of this. So, um, but the client said, no, no, no. Can't, oh, can't. Client. Client, this client response. Anyway, they build something and then 10 years later, it all comes down, they put one back up. Time it arrives now, it's a question of whether to do it right. And they built one, not as nice as the original one, but it just, sometimes it, these, these particular clients take 10 years mm. to catch up. <laughs> and you're here in the first year trying to introduce something new and, and you know, contemporary, but they've got a time rate of 10 years before they catch up to you. Mm. I understand why the way it is it's running out of boardrooms and the sorts of you know which side is working it's usually the other side <laughs> so yeah. very different very very interesting and that's the corporate world is like that when you get an exciting corporate building it's because you have an architect who really is powerful in his own projection and he has experience and knowledge and is a good salesman and has a good track record well what about the AMP yeah, well, I thought at the time that was a pretty um, that was a pretty uh, um, adventurous feeling at the mm. time. Mm. Yeah, I did, and it was interesting. I liked the form. Yeah, and much more interesting than the blue tower they built after that. Yeah, yeah, no, that one that was a good one. That was good. You know, I was still coming to terms with glass buildings, but I could see that it was. I hadn't caught well, up with them. <laughs> I mean, one of the buildings I thought was really good when I was working there was the MLC building, which was being built at the time on the corner of Edward yeah, 
Okay. Adelaide. Yeah. And it's just a, a simple egg mm. crate in front of Cape okay. Monroe. Mm. And we thought, well, the proportions are good. It's about always about and proportions uh, with those and things. What more do you need than that? Yeah. Well, that's all you've got to work with. So you've got m materials and, you know, and then you've got proportions. And if you get, uh, the eye is very good at picking up a correct proportions or comfortable proportions or natural proportions, whatever you want to call them. There's something in our makeup that understands that something is better biased and, 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 and not biased. Well, it, it was, you know, unlike all of these buildings that we've been looking at, it had a different proportion that wasn't related to the window sill. Yeah. The window. Yeah. It was the other way. It was. Yeah. It was just taking the floor to floor and choosing a space. emollient mm. to to make mm -hmm. that to make that work, and, and then separating it from the facade, which was just doing what it did. Yeah. And that seemed to be like <laughs> streets ahead of all of these other things. Mm. I mean, the Camalco building, I kind of remember. Yeah, I think that was Lee. Was it? Yeah. Well, he he went. He was responsible for. I think. Um, and I can't remember who did it, but anyway, anyway it, it apparently it leaked badly. Mm. It leaked air, and it was very expensive to air condition. Oh yeah. Oh. And so that's why they refaced it mm. and made it Different. sort of much mm. more efficient. Oh. But they did a bit more than just refacing it. I mean, it yeah. changed its whole character. Yeah. Because mind you, in those days, um, technology of windows and seals was pretty primitive. I mean, I remember in Tertiary, the first high rise we went up, it was one with a cyclone one day, and we walked into one building, and, and you walked in and you opened the door, and there's this fountain with a hose that went across the room like that, <laughs> about four or five metres. A little puddle over there. You close the door, and boom, it went down. <laughs> it was all about pressure gradients and you know tracking and all sorts of stuff. And it, I mean, it just took years to to um, refine and understand the dynamics and the hydraulics and the wind pressures. And because the wind pressure in a lot of these, you know, as you know, the, the wind direction going up is stronger than the wind direction going down. It hits them and goes up. And so the water tracks up. Yeah. It must be about yeah. windows going down. Well, I think mm. I've run out of steam. <laughs> <laughs> well, we covered all your answer, all your questions. Oh, well, I thought we must have. <laughs> yeah, we did. Did we? Yeah. Okay. Was well, anything else that we missed, Graham, that you want to uh, put on there? Oh no. In those notes you've written. Um, I. Oh, impact. I know I felt that whatever we did here had a lot of impact on students. I remember I used to I used to have a lot to do with students and and uh, this is when you were taught teaching though. Yeah. 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 And uh, um, like I remember I gave a lecture once on all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Mexico it was like <laughs> man. <laughs> I was it didn't stop me till later but it was um, well, when we were students, these people would blow in with these wow things they're doing somewhere and burying Cadillacs in the sand mm -hmm. or, you know, putting big wrenches on the Sydney Harbour Bridge or whatever it might have been sort of at any time. At the back, they used to think, where did these things come from and how are they, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> and your eyes would pop. And uh, anyway, so I did this thing on all this stuff. And... Um, it, to me, it was like I'd been living with it you know, for years and there was nothing, and I was even a bit embarrassed about some of it. And they're just sitting there with their eyes open saying, I've never seen anything like it in my life. Of course, they hadn't, because I hadn't either. You know, I mean, it was just r really original stuff. And uh, mm. you forget that this is what, you know, that's what happens with students. That reminds me. What, what is this? Yeah, okay, this is a... This is a... Um, Building, um, if you want to get that on there, yeah, that's actually that was not, not my 
and I, was, I did have that work with my working in my company. But that's a, um, it was a, a high-tech company in Kuala Lumpur. We were, build, we were about to get the contract to take all government files, police, social security, hospital, history, everything, off the old files and put it into electronic data storage. And they tran did the transfer of all the, the electronic files. And so this was a, 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 a building, but it, was, it became a little village. I decided it should be, be a, a village where they worked and had all their kind of mm. lifestyle that they wouldn't have. Most of them had come from an environment where they, they didn't have green space and restaurants and all this kind of stuff and, and be able to have a library and you know, even an office building. And this was just an office building. So it had all of these, it was built in all of these simple things and and um, it was really a very good little program, big program. And, um, and then they decided to go into the high tech investment like maze pump and all the, you know, the things that the bubble ball thing. And they were just all ready to go in the bubble ball thing. And whatever happened, the, the job stopped. Huh. Yeah. So who were you working? Well, that was with um, the email. Yeah. Carol Link. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Oh, so that's quite recent. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. That's the no, two thousand. Well, no, it's quite old. This one is the most incredible house. This is the most amazing house I ever had anything to do with. Um, it was a uh, for a uh, um, to the Lord. A Malaysian lord. They have Tan Sri as a, um, a lord, and then you have um, this other sort of like it's like Sir so like that, you know. And uh, anyway, this guy was the top of the pile, and he was Chinese, which is unusual because he built the first high rise in Kuala Lumpur when they got in, when they became independent. He just made a lot of money and solved problems for the government, and so he was a real hero. And um, anyway, he uh, had this huge property, Josh Wong owned property, and the government later came along and built an airport and took a chunk off his property, and he was really upset about it. So he then wanted to build a house for himself and three other students on the site, this huge site, you know, 10 square acres. What, next to the airport? No, this was in the city, in the, in, oh. in the most expensive part of the city, where the, all the government, all the very wealthy people live in this hilly area. This is a, a big flat site with a big hill on the end. And um, this was uh, uh, this was his house. And the house, he had he lived on his own at this point and he wanted to have two houses, one for the public and one for himself. And the public had to have like a dining hall for 500 people and a kitchen and rooms, a ho hotel basically. And then the second part was his own house, which had five bedrooms, and his two, three master bedrooms, one upstairs, one downstairs, one in the garden. And each master bedroom was bigger than this house. <laughs> and he had 40 cars in the basement. And, you know, he used those sorts of mad statistics. Anyway, he sent me off to, one weekend, to Bali, and with his chief architect, and said, uh, told his chief architect to take him around and look after me. So we went to all the hotels, stayed in all the top quality hotels in Bali and had a look, I had a place and came back and designed this. And um, it was really, it was like a palace. It was, it was a palace, basically. It was so huge. And um, I had no idea what the style would be. It just came out of everything. It was one of those completely ordinary things. But it really... Had certain Balinese things and certain Malaysian certain I don't know. Yeah. But he was happy for you to design it, and not yeah. his architect. Oh no, he, his other, his architect was like a chauffeur, yeah. <laughs> which was really bad because I knew one day something would go wrong. Right? Anyway, uh, um, I don't know whatever happened to my my uh, guy in, who was running the office in Cairo. Then decided to get a guy from Indonesia and then Indonesia collapsed and he went back and just went around and around and around. I to this day don't even really know what happened. Mm. But um, it was um, it was an amazing 
it was like, either when that, when that, the break was, I just went big funny bad dreams. That was it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they, you know there's more to it than that. <laughs> yeah, well, gradually then you eke out bits and pieces. Yeah. But all the time he'd say, you tell me, you tell me, you tell me. And I'd tell him and say, yeah, that's fine, okay, move on. Yeah. Yeah. This is like, doesn't, this doesn't happen very often and it's heading for disaster if we're not careful, you know. Mm. And um, anyway, he's one thing, he was one particularly strict, the architect said, he can't build within six meters, he has to be six meters back from the road. And he, the client said, no, no, they took my land, I'm building right to the edge. And I said, well, that's, I didn't know that I was kept getting told it was six meters. So he designed the thing right to the edge, but it was a carport and the gardens and all that stuff. And he said, I had it so it could all be chopped off. Mm. Um, and uh, so I don't know why that happened. It didn't really matter, but it was like I could see that, you know, when someone goes back to God, be so careful because they say all this and you don't know whether they really trust you. Mm. They, they trust you, they're setting you up. <laughs> or if they don't know, or whatever it is, and you just, you can't find out. You can ask all the questions. The only way you find out is to keep sign, having sign off on stuff, you know. Mm. But um, and there it's difficult. No, no, I don't sign any of that. <laughs> so, uh, mm. yeah. But, um, well, thank you. Sure, pleasure. Well, thank you.